Oh yeah, that's what I was actually looking at. I was yeah. trying to chase the cords. And then, oh now you've got now you've, yeah now you've got so you've got a lot of it might be it might be um, it's not the board it might be those cables. All right, so <laughs> you still have this hooked up? Test, test, test. Test, test. Test, test, test. Test. Test, test. Test. Test, 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 test. 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 Test, test, test. Test, 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 test. Can you hear it? Test. Test. Well, it's really it's really close to me. If it was on my let me test it when it's on my lapel. Is there not a clip on it? Yeah, there's a clip on it. Hold on. All right, I've got it clipped on now. Can you hear me now? It's just delayed, so. I've got to control the volume of this instead of the uh, mixer, so that's kind of sucks. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Can you talk to Steve? Test, test. Test. Yeah. Test. Test, test, test. Talking, one, two, three. Talking, talking, talking. One, two, three. Test. Talking. Test. Talking, one, two, three.
Test. This one? It's not on? Test, test. Test. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Test, test. Test, one, two, three. Everything sound all right? No interference? No, we're just making sure there's no interference with the lavalier in this, so. We're good? Cool. I didn't. Hi, Dan.
That light Wait, light up. Okay. And then
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, coaches, uh, it's a real pleasure to see you all here today. My name is Dan Smith. Uh, I'm the head of the SCORE 60 coaching team out of Indianapolis. Uh, I'm also the proprietor at All-Star Bowl, and I'm the immediate past president of the Indiana Bowling Centers Association. I uh, want to welcome all of you here today. I hope everything will be very informative to you or for you that you can take back to your programs. And, you know, please, uh, while we're here today, please ask questions. Okay, that's real important to us because, you know, we can sit up here and we can tell you all these things that we do. We can tell you all these things that are, you're capable of doing. But unless you ask us about it, you know, it's not really doing us a lot of good unless you're getting the information that you need. Okay, if you're not getting the information that you need for your program, okay, then we're not quite doing our jobs. And we want to make sure that we're doing those things. So like I said, can, you know, thank you for being here today. And it's great to see so many of the old faces, but it's really nice to see so many of the new ones. Uh, this is a great turnout for this program. Uh, the, these coaches clinics we've been doing the last several years, we've had extremely good turnouts for them. Everybody seems to be able to take something back to their program that's gonna help them. So we're looking forward to today. Uh, what I'm gonna do is tell you who some of the speakers are today, but we're not gonna go into their bios until they come up here and, and uh, actually talk to you. Um, Steve Padillo, Gary Brown from USBC, Steve Kunkel, of course, the commissioner of Indiana High School Bowling. Uh, Nick Hoagland, who's standing here in the back of the room, he's our lane guru. Uh, he does all the lane patterns for IBCA and for the national. Uh, Scott Savage, back here in the back from Savage Bowling. Uh, his team's responsible for the live web feed today. Scott owns a lot of the pro shops around the state, and he's a former Purdue University coach. Uh, Kristen Smith, one of my daughters, she's here today, she's back here in the back. She's going to be doing some of the online uh, demonstrations for you. You're going to see her in a video a little later on also, along with some of the kids that we work with. Uh, what I want to do first is introduce Steve. Steve's been the uh, commissioner for Indiana High School Bowling for the past 18 seasons, or this is our 18th season. Uh, Steve's done a wonderful job putting this program together. We have around 200 high schools involved, some 350 coaches, I believe. Uh, these are all programs that you know, Steve has put a lot of time, a lot of hard work into, has really dedicated himself to making sure this is growing. Uh, honestly, without his help, this would have been very tough to do. Okay, Indiana bowling, high school bowling, is really, really one of the best premier programs in the country. And it's because of this guy on the board from the IBCA. They do a wonderful job. So Steve, uh, I'm gonna have him come up, talk to you. He's gonna go through a lot of the rules and then if you have any questions about any of them, you're more than welcome to ask. Now remember, these rules are already set. Okay, so we're not gonna be up here saying, well you need to change this, you need to change that. Well, that's something you guys have to do at the end of the season. Okay, the rules are already set. He's just going to go through and tell you what some of those changes are. Steve, all you. That work? That's all. Okay, good morning. morning. A couple people that I think Dan may have skipped or maybe I didn't hear, wasn't paying attention to him. Uh, Chad Lester with Scott Savage with the part of the videotaping crew here this morning. Uh, this is also the crew that's done our taping of our state finals the last several years. And that again is in the offing for this season. Uh, as you came through, you were greeted by the door by Scott Devers, uh, the proprietor here at Arrowhead Bowl. And we're always, always comfortable coming here for events like this, for our high school, middle school tournaments, because we know that things are going to be taken care of. So 
If I could just ask a round of applause for the staff we've got here today. <laughs> now, I don't want to miss anybody. So coming in, the young lady helping check in, Kathy Sumner. She's also on staff with the Indiana Bowling Centers Association. Uh, primarily, she started with the in-school, which is the bowling carpets and pins, which she takes into the schools, teaches your PE teachers how to teach bowling. They grow up into the middle school, up into the high school. So a lot of what you're seeing now are the results of her hard work. She is also in charge of the state membership. So you see Kathy, thank her. And if you're not familiar, you're interested in getting those carpets in your area, Kathy's one to do that. Uh, a little bit more housekeeping. As we had last year here in Lafayette, Tom Taylor over at the Pro Shop has 36 used bowling balls that he wants you to take back and use. He's got them laid out on the floor in there, I guess. He'll be in around 1 o'clock. So if you want a ball, a ball's need, see Tom when he gets here. And again, he wants those to leave here and go back home. Along that line, you were given a ticket as you come in. You should have a blue and a uh, red ticket, raffle ticket. As we announced, we have nine high-performance balls up here. We're going to give away at a random raffle at lunchtime. Use them yourself. Use them for a kid that needs them. Use them for a raffle to promote your program, gain money for your program. But you're in on that drawing. Uh, also, I've got some, one of the other tickets and I'm not sure what Kathy told you, which was which, it didn't really matter. But I've got a bunch of shirts left over from last year's tournament that, again, you take them, use them, uh, help promote the program that way. That's what I've got there. Let's begin our rule changes and new for this year. This may be a little bit awkward on this side, just jumping back and forth. You were sent out this list of rules. Your uh, coordinators have had them. If you've had your uh, meetings so far with your coaches, your conference coordinators, you should have run over that. Uh, I know I've been to several of your meetings so far, so it's just going to be a repeat of that. But again, if there's a question like Dan said, we can discuss it so everybody understands what the rules are for this season. The first we had on there, who is in charge of your program. This being run and operated by the Indiana Bowling Centers Association, your host proprietor is the one in charge of your team, your program. You, in essence, are working for him. His job to work with the school and go by their recommendations, what they wish to have. I know some of the schools have taken ownership, have paid the fees, offer busing and such, all this. But again, they're working with your proprietor to know. But the main point is, if it comes back here, if there's a question of coaches squabbling or money's not being paid, whatever that co uh, case might be, your host proprietor is the one in charge of this program. He's going to have the final say to get things worked out on that. If, and there are some cases where the school and or the proprietor are indifferent about it, the coaches come in, and there's a need, in most cases, probably he has kids on a bowl, so he wants to put a team together and, and he goes with it. When there's a problem there, an issue there, that the school, the uh, proprietor not willing to tackle, myself along with that coordinator will enter in, intervene to help make decisions for the betterment of the school and of the program. And again, a lot of this stuff we have here, these changes based on issues we've had in the past. Any questions on that? Uh, the rule change on inclement weather. What we've had in the past, if the host school is not in session, you do not bowl that afternoon. Situation, Fort Wayne, 18 teams in the program. Uh, Carroll High School is out of school. Everybody else is in school. Do we cancel for Carroll High School? A decision of your conference if they're the host center bowling that afternoon, by rule, do not bowl. They cannot be required to bowl. They cannot be required to forfeit if their school is not in session. However, if the bulk of the schools are in session and wish to go ahead and bowl in just those 
two, three teams affected, makeup bowling, that's perfectly all right. If the weather changes in the afternoon, in the morning, whether it be snow, whether it be fog, whatever, an hour delay, two hour delay, let's just not go to school. Afternoon is bright and sunny. You can go ahead and bowl. That's going to be a decision of the coordinators and the coaches. But just because you weren't in school in the morning doesn't mean you can't bowl in the afternoon. But again, you can't be required, can't be made to forfeit if you weren't in school that, that day. All right? Yes. His question, the center has three teams. Which ones takes precedent? I need more information. Precedent and what? In, in hosting or? Uh, in that situation, if your school, any of those three, you were supposed to bowl at um, championship lanes, it doesn't matter who the host, that, that host center, those schools, any of those schools were out that day, again, the same rule applies. They can't be required to participate. Make sense? Yes, yes, yes. You, you can still bowl. Again, a decision, why sit out 8, 10, 12 teams when they're all in school and can bowl but one, but you can't make those guys come in. And again, a lot of times that afternoon, even though they weren't in school that day, they're able to go that afternoon. So we give you that, that leeway that you can do that. Uh, go back to, again, if the school, if you are in uh, good connection with the school and they say no, then obviously that's what you abide by. Corky? Uh, time limit for makeups? Again, it's not set per rule, but where our program is what it is, would like to get that done before the next match. Uh, the two teams get together on that, preferably at the center where they were supposed to be. But if that's not possible, no, no lanes are available there. If they can agree on a site that they can both get together before the next match, if they're having trouble working it out, the coordinator can come in and say, we're going to do this match, this center, this time. Again, our coordinators, we work with them. They've got a lot of authority that we give them. So we would like you to go where you were supposed to be. If not, agreeable center. If not, your coordinator designates where you're going to go and win. Rule change. If a student transfers after starting high school, he or she must fill out a transfer form. We, through the years of the program, have followed roughly ISHAA, but our own rules, the board doesn't want to set a kid out just because he's transferred. So we have, from the run of the program, allowed a kid to transfer even mid-season to a different school, a different team. Usually this is done when they have an actual address change going to a different school. Uh, we have asked in this situation mid-school, mid-term, to fill out a transfer form. But this year we're going a little bit further in that. ISHA, once they start high school, they stay at that school unless there's been a, a letter of transfer filed. So as, after they start high school, ninth grade, any change after that point in time has to file a letter has to get approval to go to the different school. Uh, ISHA doesn't require you to live in that district, but they, they do, we do require you to attend that school, meet their criteria in attendance and in grades. But any transfer, whatever the reason, fill out the form, file it, I'll send back approved, not approved, whatever. Any question on that one? And again, meet the school's policy, this is always a question. Uh, across the state, we are still a club program. We're not ISHAA. All that means we don't have their endorsement. We still follow the school's policy on athletic participation. Your school may have a level for club activity, or it's only a club, they've only got to do this. No, no, no. We want you to follow the athletic criteria, which in most cases may be a step higher. So even though club state-wise, we require the school's uh, requirements for participation. And again, this may be different this school and this school, 
but this school for basketball, this school for basketball, that's what we expect of your bowlers. <coughs> Changes in the uniform rule. Classic is no longer our chosen vendor, our push vendor, only vendor. They are still in the shirt processing business. They will still do your shorts. It's just what they have found as we've expanded from 90 schools up to now over 200 with over 350 teams and tryouts. You guys always wait to the last two weeks to get them in. <laughs> Flooded with that, they can't process them in that two week period. So allowing you to use your vendor to do this, uh, and in most cases he can meet that two week timetable. But to get that, if you don't use Classic, and again, they are still doing it. They just didn't print out the flyer this year. But if you use somebody else, there's a form that you fill out, your proprietor, your coach, and your vendor asking for the artwork. And it's a one-year contract, no charge. Send to me. I approve it. Send it back to your vendor. They get the artwork. They can print your shirts. So that is the same as what it has been. We had stated we were going to have a new logo this year with this change. A lot of unexpected delays, so that's been put up and postponed. When that new logo comes into effect, we're going to give you a four-year window to make that change. A kid that's a freshman will be able to wear that same shirt all the way through. If you have new shirts added to that, you might have some kids with the old logo, some with the new logo, but four years out when everybody will have to have the new logo. Okay? We're not changing logos this year. They're no longer, but they're still going to print shirts and they're still going to make a regular donation to the program. Steve? Yes. On, the, on that, I think I emailed you a question about it, but if, if we stay with Classic, everything is the same. We just fill out the sheet that comes in our packet. Yes. Now, Greg is in Annapolis. They still order their shirts, the whole Indianapolis conference, all 25 schools. And so his is a little bit different than what the rest of you are. But uh, to my knowledge, they love work with Indianapolis and nothing will change for you guys. Whether it be the, and, and they do change new shirts. They have in the past kept the bottom line on the cost of the shirts. And every year they put a new shirt on the kids back. But again, you guys that buy your own and maybe have a higher dollar shirt and, and use more than just the one year you'll have that grandfather rule that you have four years to make the transition. Okay? Now this says 1920. Uh, I'm going to assume we'll probably push that back to 2021 because this was expecting to have the new shirt logo this year. The new pants rule. This is the rule that's been changed every other year for the 20 years of the program. The thought from the start was appearance and dress slacks. I've got on dress slacks. Everybody should have something similar to me. Your color doesn't matter, but the team matches whether they're black, whether they're khaki, sand, blue, whatever the case might be, if the team matches. This rule, the thought has been the same for the 18 years. But I guarantee if I go around the room, Every conference in here abides by the rule and enforces the rule. You all say you do. But without question, when we get to the tournament, now we've got this conference coming with this conference with this conference. Well, how come they're doing that? How come they get to do that? We can't do that. So we keep trying to have a uniform rule across the state. In your packets, you've got pictures this year of what's acceptable and what's not acceptable and what the guidelines, what we're expecting of you. Uh, by rule, the yoga pants or skinny jeans are not allowed. You go around the state, yoga, and I guess that's Miss Stell probably, isn't it? <laughs> yoga, uh, not acceptable here, unacceptable. But yoga is different across the state. In Evansville, they got this idea Fort Wayne's got this idea, Merrillville's got this idea. The terminology doesn't carry across the state. Hopefully pictures will carry across the state that this is what we're after, okay? 
And again, the same as it's been, no athletic wear, uh, sweatpants, uh, pants with a stripe down the side, the swishy pants, no cargo pants with the big floppy pockets. And again, we want our kids to look and present a great program. Uh, early on in the year we started, we had this and was questioned on the ISHA program book. They had the, one of the teams, golf teams, and I forget how whether they were in shorts or whether they were wearing cargo pants, but that was contrary to what we expected. So this is what we're after, hopefully, with the pictures. And again, you guys take care of yourself and your conference and your team, and things should work out as we go on through the, the tournament then. Now, the next one I've got is USBC rule number 12. And the reason I bring that up specifically because it was an issue in the championship match of this last year's state finals. Uh, one of the kids was going to put talcum powder or the easy slide on the bottom of his shoe. The other coach objected, rightfully so. We stopped it. Uh, Dad wasn't real happy with it. The kid was a little bit flustered. They didn't win. I don't think that that really was the, the outcome or the changer, but because it did happen, I bring to your attention. I'm sure all you guys, gals in your league, you probably have people doing it, using it. Saturday morning leagues, probably even in your high, high school conferences, you've had people doing that. We are USBC certified. We want to follow their rules, this being one of them. You see it, stop it, because going on down the tournament trail, again, when we all get together, this is what we're going to be looked at. Gary or Steven, you guys want anything to add on that one? You guys got questions on that? Okay. Steve? Yes? What about the slide stick? Are they allowed to use a slide stick? Officially, no. For, just so you know, I mean, uh, she asked if you could use a slide stick. Uh, for junior gold, for collegiate, we've actually said no. We're doing some more research on whether or not there's actually a substance applied to it. Uh, so at this point, for all the stuff that I run, which is junior gold, collegiate bowling, uh, youth open, survivor, all the side events, we're actually not permitting that to be used on the approaches at this time. So. Thank you, Gary. Any other question on that one? Now, another one that I've got, and I don't have on the slides here, but while we're in the USBC rules, uh, a couple of the planning programs I've been at, they've asked about the requirements of a two-handed bowler, specifically on a bowling ball, the two-handed bowler. Uh, Tom talked to us last year. Mike Riggins is here. Mike talked to Anderson last year. But basically, if you've got a kid bowling two-handed, he still has a dominant hand. Left hand, right hand, has to stay with that dominant hand throughout. Now, he's only allowed one weight hole, one balance hole in his bowling ball. So if the kid has a weight hole and a thumb hole and decide he's going to bowl just two-handed now and doesn't use that thumb hole, it's an illegal ball. He now has two weight holes in essence. So can I do that? That's the basic thing I'm going to go in there. Can Gary, Steven, any, any questions on that specifically? That's an accurate interpretation of the rule, and we've had a lot of questions when people initially heard the rule and had heard the change. Um, but that's exactly how we abide by it um, from the coaching perspective. The policing of it is the responsibility of those obviously in the facility. Um, so it's not something that uh, Gary or myself would actually be at an event and, and not be able to police ourselves, but we would expect that the coaching staff would police it as well. And that's where we hope the, the rule gets enforced. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, obviously, if they use their thumb, what if it's what if they decide to put a just a monster hole in there and say yeah I put my thumb in it but it's obviously not being used. Okay. okay. Did you hear the question on that everybody on the other side of the room? Yeah. Using a thumb hole. Okay. Using a thumb hole but it's got a monster thumb hole which obviously is not being used for the gripping purpose. Is that okay or not? As long as there's just one hole, and whether it's used for gripping or not, it's about, it, there's just one, then that's allowable. Right. It's when you have two, and one is a large hole that is, a grip, that is sometimes used as a gripping hole, that is not allowed because at the point when they're gripping, it's now a thumb hole. When they're not gripping, now it's two balance holes. Right, then what I'm saying is they, they put a thumb in the ball, mm -hmm. in, the, in the thumb hole, okay. but the thumb hole's an inch and a half wide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the size of the thumb hole is not, um, well, 
there is a rule regarding the actual size and pitch, um, the width of the hole with a pitch inside of it. If the thumb hole is, is outside of that specification, obviously it's, it's not allowed inside the ball. But if it's a large enough hole that falls within that rule of specification for it not having pitch but still being a certain width across the top, then if it's a gripping hole, then it's whatever the size, regardless of their thumb, is still a gripping hole. It doesn't matter the size. Okay. So they, can still have they can still have a gripping hole and then have a balance hole inside that. Yes, as long yeah, the, th the size of the hole doesn't matter so much as long as they're using it for gripping. Okay, okay any other? Diana? Just trying to be clear because I have a boy who there's two holes and he uses them for a couple of the fingers for part of the time, but he throws basically the two hand the two handed. So we got to make him change. In my understanding, can't have two holes for any reason. Is that the, the question she has a boy bowling two handed. He's got two holes, not always using them. If that's what yeah, I understand. He uses it for part of the time, not the entire. Evidently, not. The entire. Again, the the rule cannot have more than one open hole during a delivery. If he's using two, using one, but if he's got, you know, just using one of those two, he cannot have another weight hole or balance hole beside that, or thumb hole, whatever the case is. Okay, and is that for youth bowling as well? USBC. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. okay. you remove the finger, that is now a balance hole. Anytime you remove a finger, that is a balance hole. Okay, the final one that I wanted to touch here, again, this came to me, I guess, a couple different places. Uh, USBC Rule 400 does not allow your bowlers, youth bowlers, to participate in money events where they can win cash or prizes. Uh, they don't have to win these prizes if they're bowling in events where they can win it's a violation by rule bowling in a singles event any singles event and those monies being designated before starting by filling out a waiver those winnings will go into a scholarship the smart scholarship fund is permissible no caches can be awarded merchandise up to four or five hundred dollars that is a one-time event up to the five hundred dollars this came up in, in Evansville per event, per career, per season. It's $500 merchandise per event. Uh, maybe you're familiar, maybe not, but Jeffrey Mann here in Lafayette won the junior gold this past, you know, a couple months ago. He's been invited to go to Texas for a program where merchandise may be given. Uh, Steve and Gary say that any kind of Sponsorship does not apply to this rule. This is winning, you know, so much money, five hundred dollars. Is that accurate? That a sponsorship is is differently, Gary. Uh, just so you know, the way we interpreted in the rules area was that a rule four hundred violation sort of addressed is it's two or more people on a team where you're earning cash. If anybody in that event's earning cash, the most common question I get because I've been in the rules for five years, then I moved over to the, the youth department is whether or not me and him could bowl together as two youths in an adult league and still not accept the cash. That's still illegal. It's anybody in that competition where anybody two or more is earning cash. The question regarding Rule 400 and sponsorships, we do not deem that as illegal. Uh, across the rules platform, across Junior Gold, across anything we do internally. Now, when you get into the future, um, you know, college bowling, um, sorry, into like NCA, NEI, there may be some different rules interpretations to that. But for our purposes, the USBC for the youth area, it is okay for you to be on a contract with a manufacturer or pro shop or there anything that you guys want to do out there. So, and there's no limit, no limit to the amount of equipment you can accept. Okay. And again, any of these questions that we don't answer here, obviously I'll be around for the day. Stephen and Gary will be around. Uh, to get with them individually and knock it out from there, but that's a broad term answer. Yes, Dan. I have another question. Um, this week, past week, I saw one of the youth coaches to the little kids giving out a dollar bill as incentive for their first strike. Does that kind of play stuff follow your guidance? I mean, is that okay, or we've got to be real? Did you hear that one? This week or past week, in youth bowling league saw one of the coaches giving a kid a dollar bill for a strike 
Violation to the rule. Yeah, that's a violation. It's cash. It's technically it's a cash violation. You can't accept cash. They can do a gift certificate for non redeemable for cash uh, to like the pro shop, to the snack bar, to anywhere they want to do it, but you just can't physically give that kid cash. Even though most of us probably grew up and your parents gave you a quarter for your first strike or something you did good, so technically that's all illegal. Uh, we get the same question in roulette bowling, moonlight bowling, all that kind of stuff. They can go do all that kind of those pieces with it. So but that is actually illegal. Okay. Now you see the difference in age here from dollar now to a quarter when he started. <laughs> But again, that's, that's the violation now. To cover that used to be, again, the difference in age. Once you violated that rule, you were done with your junior bowling. But I say primarily because of high school bowling, but other things involved as well, that if a kid unknowingly makes a mistake and bowls an event and disqualifies himself, we, USBC, does allow them back into youth bowling through the procedure, what it might be, but for us, a kid found in violation, a mandatory one match suspension, once they fulfill that suspension, then they're eligible to come back in. And so I would tell you as coaches, always question your kids at the start of the season if somebody bowled in the summer, maybe a freshman coming in didn't know, announce it, report it right up front, serve as suspension the first match of the season, then go on. If it comes to our attention later on, specifically another coach saw it and is waiting to throw that hammer tournament time to disqualify that kid, your team, when we get it, it's the next match. And unfortunately, we've had to enforce that a few times over the last several years. So question your kids. Make sure they're in, uh, within violation there and move forward after your, your mandatory suspension. And just so you know, the reinstatement process is very quick. They can almost do it the same day. So when you, the quickest way to do that reinstatement process, which happens frequently, I can tell you just from the calls and emails we get, go to that <laughs> league secretary, have that league secretary supply a document at the same time where he violated the rule he or she that says Gary Brown did not violate the rule or did not accept cash or prizes or how much they accepted. Have them send a check for the amount of money if they did accept money to USBC rules, and then they'll reimburse it back to the league. It's a very quick process. It used to be a lot more lengthy. Uh, we streamlined it a few years back, but it's, it, it's almost today where you can get in the same day or the same week. So just a recommendation to you. Yes. Okay. Yes, Greg. I want, I want to back up just a second. You're back on the, the, the balance holes. The, the question was brought up regarding the, the two-handed bowler not using the thumb. But there's also a situation where you might have a balance hole in the ball, and some people will pull a ring finger out in an effort to uh, kill the ball, go for a corner. Thing. So that's the equivalent. Okay, the question again, if you haven't heard, or for the, the um, web stream, and I guess this could be either a two handed bowler or one handed bowler, has got a weight hole, shooting a spare more than likely, pulls a finger out to kill the roll on the ball, thus creating two holes not in use. Again, guys, what do you say on that one? That's illegal. It's illegal. Yep. Two balance holes. It is two balance holes. It is illegal. Again, enforcement, you guys here are in the trenches. You see it. Uh, enforcement of, once you call it, if they continue to do it, then could go to the next step, could forfeit, could remove the kid from playing field. But that, by their rules, would be a violation. Okay? Uh, schedule requirements. I'm sure that most of you fit within this, but through the years, we have required at least one position round. That position round is Baker games. Those Baker games are 10 Baker games, two points each. The reason being that was in preparation for the tournament. We do use Baker games in the tournament, and we didn't want you to go all season and have a surprise. Across the state, they've used those Baker games to balance out the schedule, depending how many teams you have, how many weeks you're bowling. But again, we're requiring at least five regular matches, which is 10 games, and a Baker round. The five matches, two games is 10 games. Our all-state nominations require a 10-game average. So that's the reason for that. 
The reason it's put in this year, I'll touch here in a little bit, but we're changing the tournament format from regular games and Baker games for the team event to straight Baker games. So I know that some of your conferences, maybe several of your conferences are trying to bowl more Baker games in conference play to be better prepared for the tournament. And that's fine. We don't require other than got to have at least five regular and one Baker. Okay, the tournament rule, team qualifying. Instead of the regular games, we're going to bowl 12 Baker games to qualify for the stepladder. This was proposed a year ago at our after action meeting. Unanimously, unanimously across the people there wanted to go to Baker Games. The thought being Baker Games is more a mirror of your team play than regular games and Baker Games. Collegiately, you guys, um, Gary and Nick, I know bold for IU, understand this morning that they were just two years apart and actually roommates, but Collegiately, you see a lot of Baker games. So in preparation for that, if you will, but you guys at Bold Tournament realize that it's uh, a lot of fun. The kids like it. The parents like it. So we're making that move to 12 Baker games for qualifying. Step ladder will be the same as it has been. Whoever's in the step ladder, two Baker game match, total pins to decide. That is the step this year. And again, that I could see changing going forward, but brought up unanimously. I took it around last year as I traveled. Wasn't any kickbacks, so that will be the rule. 2017 when we enter tournament for a sectional all the way through. Question on that one? What is the penalty for too many people in the bowlers area? The rule has been forever. Team has allowed five players and two coaches in the immediate bowlers area, except when you're substituting. That has been the rule, but there's been no enforcement. Anybody that knows me know that I'm not out there counting heads in the term of play. But if somebody comes to me and says, they've got too many players down there. And a lot of times it comes from the spectators out back here. They can't see. They pay money to get in. And a team, or even if you got two teams with five coaches and ten players, and they're all around the ball return, Number one, it's too crowded down there in most places for that. Number two, uh, the people back behind can't see. Number three, for the players playing, you just can't get around. So that's the reason for the rule. The enforcement, we've had it, but coaches don't listen to us, or as soon as we walk away, they go back. So the penalty this year is after a coach comes and tells the tournament director, we go down and tell the other coach verbally, you know, you got to watch your five players, two coaches in the immediate area. If we have to go back again, we're going to deduct 10 pins from their score. If we have to go back the third, fourth, fifth, whatever time it is, we will deduct 10 pins from their score. Now, I hope we don't have to do that. I hope you guys as coaches understand the rule and the reasoning of the rule and have your players toe the mark, stay in line. And again, I understand the kids want to be a part of the team. You've got seven on your tournament roster, and they all want to be, well, they can stand back here and watch. But up around here, and I know the high fives, yes, yeah, it's just too big, too big a mess down here. So that's the reason, that's the enforcement. Are you going to define that area at each center? Each center, each tournament is going to have to define that area so you as coaches know what it is. And again, I'm saying the intent of the rule is the immediate area up around the ball return. Michael? Okay, you just got that question. Okay. So yeah, the, 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 the question was, are we going to define that area? The answer is each tournament, you know, they've got a different setup. They will discuss that. They will talk at in your coaches meeting, defining that area. But again, the intent for me, whatever the player's area is, these kids can be back, but just not up around that ball return and the you know, adding confusion there. And again, for the people back behind watching, if your two subs are back here sitting, you know, they're not in the way of the view, they're not impeding play, anything else. Corey? Now it's after practice, right? Yes, after practice, once you're in competition. Uh, probably most of you use all your players down there warming up, see who's got the best look or whatever. Okay? Okay, moving on to the singles. 
what we're asking here is each player is allowed one coach during qualifying and then once they get to the step ladder we allow two coaches with them and again the same intent of the rule because of crowd control at your sectionals at your regionals probably not a big deal not a big problem but as we move on in the tournament a team has seven coaches and now in the semi state you got one kid playing and all seven coaches are down there no we're going to allow just one-on-one -on -one. somebody asked the other day i'm coaching girls i got a boys coach i mean i can't go down there and see how the girls are doing about how the no obviously you can but you just can't stand there and again create a, a problem uh, again i hope this does not have to be enforced other than just reminders that time to time uh, we've got to keep the area cleared out here but the same 10 pin penalty will apply if we have to continually go back and tell you you got too many players down here too many coaches Our all-state teams, the criteria for the academic all-state has changed. Uh, the SAT score, and, and again back, these are changes. The grade point average is still a 3.5 and a 4 point scale, but changes SAT was, has been 1,500 for math, reading, and writing. Last year, somebody brought to my attention that ISHA had changed, and so we changed ours for this year now counting just uh, reading and math. So 500 or 1,000 points total for reading and math. Writing is not in the equivalent anymore. And ACT, we had at 22. But again, ISHA changed there, bumped it up to 23. So again, that's what we're going to do for the ACT score. So the GPA of 3.5 or the equivalent if they've got a 12 point sc uh, schedule translated down but either 1000 for the SAT or 23 for the ACT these forms are always uh, deadline is the Wednesday after your sectional is completed to get turned in for your academic you need a transcript from the school signature from the school administrator whether it be the principal or guidance whatever verifying you've got accurate records on that. Anybody submitted does make that academic all-state team. Uh, the last several years has been around 50 or 60 kids. Surprisingly to me, more boys than girls have, have been nominated for this. But again, everybody that qualifies. On your all-state nominations, the coach coordinator should submit at least the top three averages from your, your conference and those who advance from the sectional. Off of those applications, we award three different teams, an all-region team, an all-tournament team, and the all-state team. The region teams count the scores from conference and sectional in that six regionals that we play. So if a kid has a high average in his conference, it's going to carry a lot of weight for that region team. If he makes it out of the sectional, he could have a good run in tournament, even though maybe 150 average in the conference, but places, makes low way the state finals, could score enough points to make the all-tournament team. And then, of course, the all-state takes the total pins or the total points from conference all the way through the tournament. So those three teams based off of that one application. We had the situation last year. A kid had the top average in his conference. I forget now whether he won the sectional, but at least placed high but didn't make this all-region team because his coach didn't submit his application. This year, because of that, trying to eliminate, you guys still do your job, but anybody that I catch before the teams are announced that I can add to that team so we don't short somebody, uh, I've been given permission to do that. The last number of years, I've been adding the top 10 averages, and anybody that made it to the state finals, if they haven't been submitted, I put them in. But again, this last year, we missed a kid. Top average and section winner should have been on that all-region team, and we missed him. So just opening it up. You guys do your job. If you got a top kid in the conference, not just your team, in the conference, uh, turn him in. Every year, I have kids submitted that get zero points. The coach turns in a kid 150 average. It doesn't make the sectional. Zero points. Obviously not going to get on a team with zero points. But better to turn in anybody, everybody, and make me go through the work of it than missing somebody. 
So if, if you miss them, again, coaches, that's going to come back on you. Do your job and make sure your kids are recognized. The Bowler of the Year selection. Again, we have used this same nomination application. Total points for the year, the top boy and girl, we named Bowler of the Year. We thought last year after the state finals that we had a tie. I thought we had in our rules that a tie is broken by the top finish at the state finals. Didn't find that, so that's what we put in this year. A tie in points for Bowler of the Year. We'll go to the state finals if there's a tie there. And again, how can there be a tie at the state finals? Sixth and seventh at 6-10 apiece. You know, that's still tied. So we'll go on back to the semi-state to break that tie, the higher finish, on back to the regional, on back to the sectional if we have to. So it's in print, tie for the bowl of the year. We've got a, a tiebreaker already in the system. This is something that we have come up with numerous, numerous, numerous times. Bowling in the season we do. We talked about inclement weather earlier for your conference, but again, your conference, you're in a smaller area, but as advancing in the tournament, you're traveling further distance. Regional, usually within an hour where you're going. Semi-state, the upper hard part of the state, the lower part of the state, and of course the finals all over the state to one location. We cannot make the rule that because Garrett is not in school that we're not gonna bowl in Evansville. So you've got to, if your kids qualify, the weather at that location and how you get to that location, know in advance if it means going you know, for Friday night so you'll be there for Saturday, if it means going three hours early for Saturday morning so you're there. But booking these spots at the centers and rebooking stuff at this time of year, the proprietors are busy in most cases. so unless it's the weather that we cannot bowl, that they're telling us not to be on the roads, we're gonna make every effort to bowl. All that happens, the center is gonna have the most accurate information whether we're playing or not. If we have to reschedule, we have a couple times, we'll get the word back out to you coaches. Uh, but in most cases, we're gonna bowl, plan accordingly. On your forms, you have to fill out, again, another good reason to have your contact information, your cell numbers down if we have to get a hold of you. With that in mind, we asked you last year, went back to the uh, Bowling Center's Board of Directors. Next season, we are going to finish two weeks earlier. We're cutting the season two weeks shorter. So the tournament is done in January, or the first week in February, perhaps, uh, giving a little bit more time between our middle school program this, the state youth program, weather hopefully be a little bit different, and you know, maybe buffer time. But, uh, 17, 18, we're going to finish two weeks earlier, probably for you guys in, in a conference play, finishing up your conference play even before you go to Christmas, right after the week after you come back, and then right into your tournament play. Uh, I mentioned earlier, again, we're going to tape the state finals. Last year, uh, those who were familiar and maybe watched the video replay on it, we taped the boys and girls together. We taped all three matches in the singles event, so it wasn't just the top two, but everybody that made the step ladder was able to get on the, the taping, which I think was a good thing. I didn't hear any complaints on that. We still just did the team event, the championship match. But again, we did the boys and girls together. And the big thing there, in essence, to save some time, a year ago at Anderson, it was 9 o'clock before we got out of there. So the day when we started was 9, 10 o'clock we finished. We've done things to change, to shorten the day. And again, this, uh, what we've done is to help shorten, to get the kids the exposure, but you know, keep the thing moving along. That's what I've got. Any questions for these changes, these rules, or things that are others that have come up in the past? Gary? And again, the question, the reasoning behind moving it up two weeks more, which into more inclement weather. Um, shortening the season was the big thing. 
whether the weather is worse, bad Indiana, it can be anywhere from November through. I think Gary did study, said that moving back the other way, but talking to you coaches, the center's moving back the other way with all the programs going on, you guys bowling, the youth state tournament stuff, that just didn't seem like the best reason. So I don't know a, a better reason, talk with the IBCA board, but just the effort of shortening the season. Anything else? Anybody else? Yes. Um, going back to qualifying for Allstate, it's just SATs or ACTs. It's not both, right? Yes. On the academic Allstate, 3.5 GPA and either the SAT of 1,000 or ACT of 23. You don't need both SAT and ACT, one or the other. Anybody? Yes, Larry. On the, t on the shirts, since we're not using classic, is there any, you know, before, if you ordered from Classic, they could you know, be late in wearing their shirts for me. Is there still, is that now gone? On the shirts, we had promoted in the past, if you use Classic, our chosen vendor, and you don't get your order in on time, you don't get the shirts on time, we demanded the conference coordinators allow a leeway on time. Classic not being the chosen vendor you don't have to go to classic it's up to your vendor to get your shirts done by the time you start so again working with your coordinators how hard they enforce that maybe they'll give you a leeway of a week or two maybe specific situations big small sizes but we don't have in the rules anything there by the rules when you start your conference play you should have your uniform that answer anybody else Okay, again, I'm here through the day. If anything comes up, you can see me. Again, I thank you guys for coming. Uh, like Dan said, there's some that I've seen year after year, some that are new. But you guys are the reason this program is successful, and I appreciate the fact that you have taken the time to better yourselves, to better your program. Thank you. Dan?
Okay, we ready to get started again? Okay, one of our guests here today uh, from USBC is Gary Brown. He's the managing director of the International Bowling Campus, the IBC Youth Development. He supervises all the United States Bowling Congress and Bowling Proprietors Association of America Youth Programs. Gary uh, actually reports to the director of the, United, uh, the USBC and the BPAA. Uh, Gary's got a proven track record, a uh, great collaboration with the industry stakeholders, and you know he's he's a great fit to continue in this effort that we're that we're, everybody is promoting right now. Gary also brings television event experience to the job. He's you know he's worked for CBS and ESPN in various production roles, uh, and for the live telecast. He has a bachelor's degree in sports marketing management and a master's degree in sports management and athletic administration from Indiana University. He also was a member of the Hoosiers varsity bowling team, so it's my pleasure to introduce to you today Gary Brown from USDC. Okay. Stand right in front of the presentation. I got you. Stand right here the whole time. I got you. Uh, again, thank you very much for allowing me to be here. Um, just a little bit of my background as well. I grew up in the sport of bowling. My grandma worked at Muncie Lanes, for those who are from Muncie, for 30 plus years in the, in the nursery area. My parents both bowled. Mom basically bowled the day before I was born. So, and literally bowled, I should say, the day before I was born. Uh, I grew up bowling TKOs, traveled around the state bowling tournaments, so I have a strong passion for the sport. I say it every day, I'm the most blessed person in this industry for my job. I get to work with junior gold, I get to work with collegiate bowling, I get to work with high school bowling, I get to work with youth bowling. Every day I walk in, I see that bowling pin, I say I'm blessed for what I get to do. Um, family, all bowls. My cousin's right here, he's coaching one of the programs here, so it's me, it's, a, it's just an admiration for what you guys do because in the end, a lot of you guys are volunteers, and volunteers are paid very little. And in that pace, we, we really understand that, that that's the backbone of what we do in this industry is what you guys do at the local level. We can't outreach to everybody. And it's just it's, it's so admirable what you guys do with that piece. Uh, I want to get into one thing before I even get into my slides because I didn't hear the thing about the pro shop having the 36 bowling balls uh, that are donating. Are any of you guys aware of the SETS program we have at headquarters? Is anybody? Raise your hand. Okay, just a couple of you. For those who don't know, we have a program that's for uh, schools. Basically what you do is you apply for bowling balls. I can tell you we have a four, five, six pallets full of bowling balls at, at headquarters. Apply for it. They're most likely you're going to get it. There's five bowling balls that we give out to school, I would tell you, because of how many pallets we have right now. There may be more applicable for that. So if you go to bull.com high school, there's an application online. Email me. I'll give you my email, my contact information at the end. But reach out to us, apply for those. Those are for those kids. There's very little criteria to do it. It's basically fill out the application, put together your pieces. But I did hear that, and it just spurred my idea, saying, you know what, this is something I probably should bring up in front of this group. There's two pieces to it. There's one for individuals, and there's also one for teams. So the individual one, it has to be on the school uh, federal lunch program. The team one's a little bit different. It's just an application process. It changed this year. A lot of things that were on there before have kind of went away with that program. Um, but the application process is there. So I would tell you, if your school or you have brand new bowlers who are coming in who do need brand new blank equipment, some of it's older, some of it's newer, uh, just send it out and let us know. So what we're going to have to do is kind of talk about coaching. Uh, I oversee the youth department headquarters. Uh, we used to be USBC youth. We used to be BPA youth. Uh, realistically, now we're IBC youth, but we also call ourselves IB, IBC youth development because development is the key word. From the little kids, my little six-year-old son, to my 10-year-old daughter, to me bullying in high school, to me bullying collegiately, all those are development pieces on a ladder that we've talked about you know, for the last four or five years. When we talk about a coach, we say, this is a definition I stole from someone because I thought it was really good, but it says a coach is someone who assists in the learning and development of another person or team of people in order to support, or sorry, in order to improve their performance in a sport and who supports the personal development of individuals using sport as a vehicle for change and development. To me, what this means is you guys are influencing the kids' lives. You're not only teaching them social skills, you're also teaching them responsibility, you're talking, teaching them cooperation, but you're also teaching them skills on the lane. All those pieces are such key in instrumental things that you have as you go through life. On coaching, 
We believe the coaching's not a short-term plan. Uh, if you go through all of our programming, Bolopolis, Bowler's Ed, Collegiate, High School, all those things, every single one of those things have some aspect of coaching. It just depends on how you take it. You know, at the Bolopolis level, we do it as fun. We introduce them through video and cartoons, communicate at a level they can do. Bowler's Ed, teach along other sports inside the schools. High School Bowling is what you guys do here to kind of develop them for the collegiate level. Junior Gold is a development tool for Team USA. So all these things that we do inside the building really develop them and move them on for a longer term plan. So we kind of look at it as really from 6 to 20. Because once they're 20, they're on the adult side and they go over to a different department for us. Coaching is a hard participation in player development. Um, you guys bring the kids in. They bring it peer to peer. But in the end, it's how you treat those kids on the lanes. It's how you develop them. It's how you talk to them, how you communicate with them. If they don't have a good, sit, uh, good situation with you, they're probably not going to invite their friends in. Uh, bowling is such a great sport because it's unique that anybody can do it. Anybody from any level, any skill set, athletic ability, anybody can do it. So uh, I said before, when my first state championships, I used to be the high school manager at headquarters. I went to New Mexico. A kid who was the all-state Mr. Baseball for uh, New Mexico and a kid that was completely antisocial in the school, seeing those two kids down in the settee area socializing was something for me that just really resonated with me. And that's where I got a lot of passion for what I did with the sport. And now I'm also going to get into what, what are we doing at headquarters to help develop and teach the game. That work. You know, the key thing is it's got to be fun. If it's not fun, they're going to leave it. Uh, every study you read out there in any kind of sports that are out there, 70% of the kids leave a sport because it's not fun. We want as coaches, we are driven, uh, us as adults, us as parents are driven to say we want our kids to succeed. But they can only succeed through a couple of ways. It has to be fun. We have to also build on those losses, build on those victories. If it's not fun for them, they're going to leave. Everything you see in the studies, like I said, 70%, they leave the sport by the age of 13 because they're not having any fun in that sport. We keep them active. Uh, we have a great poster, it's called uh, Bowling is Healthy, and it talks about the actual social aspects, about the healthy aspects of our sport. Something that you, people don't realize how much you walk, how much you burn, get your Fitbit out, walk up and down, bowl eight games, bowl 16 games in a tournament. You'll see how much exercise, throw a 15 or 16 pound ball down the lanes. All those things are exercise pieces that we promote as it's active and promotion to it. You're teaching them life skills, got into it at the beginning. This is something that nobody really casts, I think, a lot of times when you're doing this. Collaboration, communication, teamwork, leadership, being able to follow, and all those things that they do on the lanes are so essential. I can tell you from the college aspect, I've been around since 1993 with college bowling. Those are a lot of traits that coaches are going to look for. They're going to look, they're not always going to look at the skill set. They can coach, they can teach. Scott Savage is a great coach. You know, Stephen Padilla coached at Florida State. All these guys are great coaches. They can teach the skill set, but they can't teach those kids working together as a team. And obviously you increase the skill development. That's, you know, in the end, that's what we're here to do. We're here to teach them to understand more about ball dynamics, lane services, or lanes, uh, lane patterns, ball services, hand positions, all those things that are part of the goal. Um, we talk about coaching a lot. We say, you know, who's important? You are. If you watch Hall of Fame speeches, I talk about this with my, with my kids a lot when we watch the Hall of Fame, you know, football, Hall of Fame, basketball. Who's one of the people they always pay tribute to? A lot of times they're high school coaches. Because that's the person who sets that foundation where you really start skill development. Everything you do before that is really based upon fun and basic, uh, basic fundamentals. But when you get into the high school level a little bit further along the line, that's where you're starting to develop the tools to make that kid successful for future competitions. Everything you do at this lower level develops them at the higher level. Talked about it before for us. We have a ladder. You've probably seen it before, but it starts at Bolopolis, goes into USA Bowling, goes into Bowler's Ed. All of those things that we do are creating those basic fundamentals to teach the sport to the kids as they go along. There are a lot of options out there. Again, I've got a six-year-old and a 10-year-old. Baseball, basketball, football for one, dance, bowling, de uh, baseball, softball. All these things are out there for my kids. In the end, where I want them to go, I don't want to be bowlers. I was a bowler. I want them to be bowlers. Am I going to force it on them? No, but that's why we bowl a family league, because of that structure that we have. My kids love to go watch this bowl and have fun with it. But all those skills I'm teaching them during that adult youth league on Sunday nights at 6 o'clock and I'm missing football, which I miss, but I miss my football, is those things I'm teaching them are also going to get them to the next level if they want to go that high. Um, you know, your coaching methods of communication impact the youth's future. Talk about it all the time. Steven's going to get into some of those with the different styles you have to. Are you Bobby Knight or are you not Bobby Knight? Because we're all from Indiana. We all from everything. You know, are you when it gets in the face and yells? Maybe that's the right way for your teams. Are you strict or are you not strict? 
that coaching philosophy has changed tremendously over the years. And if you do any readings or any studies on it, it's, it's not the coach being the central focus of anything anymore. It's really the players. The players are the central focus. It's bringing them back in and getting input back from them. It's also the drills. All the drills, things that we do are great, but it's also doing free play. It's all these things when you start reading into social cycles of what kids like today. You know, I've got, again, two. I've, I deal with millennials at work all the time. That group is a completely different group of way than I was. I'm 41, so it's a little different than I was. Those drills are what you went out and did every day. Roll it down 10, roll it down 15, roll it down spare shots, go across lane. All these things, three, six, nines. Those are the drills that you constantly did as you developed. Now it's a lot more free play that they, they will go with. <coughs> talk about the early development in three different stages. We talk about early development. The coaches are usually volunteers. The Saturday morning leagues, I can tell you, now, I don't know if I ever had a coach who had been certified or qualified in that aspect. They were all good bowlers, but I would say that none of them went through any certification process. Stevens group and their group, they have a great certification process. We have some steps for USA Bowling I'll get into, but I would tell you anybody who's not gone through any certification, that's a key to this piece that you can go through. A middle development, which is usually somewhere between 10 and 14, 9 and 14. Um, there's a little bit more knowledge, maybe some basic certification. It's being able to, you know, how do you hold the ball? What do you look at on lane? What's targeting? All those little things that are part of the sport. You know, level one, maybe bronze uh, through our certification process. Through all the stuff that Dan does, he'll tell you the same thing. Those, as you get skill set a lot higher, it's actually the, the, uh, the talent of the coaches and knowledge gets a little bit deeper. At the highest level, it's more experience and higher certification. You'd almost think it would be backwards. You would think it would be flipped. You'd want all those people with all that experience and knowledge and certification to be at the beginning because that's where you're teaching the fundamentals of that. That's why, in my opinion, for what it's worth, all those early volunteers, that's why we're going out and teaching the sport, teaching people to how to teach, how to, how to teach the sport. Again, to start, talk about a lot of times, uh, teach the kids how to be passionate and fun. That's the basic fundamentals of every sport we have. You're going to hear us saying everything we do through our department, every presentation we do, it's fun. If they are miserable, they're not going to come back. If they don't like it, they're not going to come back. They need to have that social aspect. It has to be fun. And that starts at the very elementary level. My six-year-old goes out to league and I don't care if he two hands it. I don't care if he push bowls. I don't care if he throws one hand. I don't care if he gets zero. As long as he has fun. But when he knocks down pins, he does his little dance and he's excited, I know he's having fun. My daughter, who's uber competitive, she doesn't knock down pins, she gets angry. She does what I did, kick the ball return. But sorry, guys. <laughs> sorry, proprietors in the room. Uh, but she does the same thing. She turns around, she stomps back. I just stink. I'm not any good. But, you know, and I say, baby, it's fine. Just have fun. It's all about enjoying yourself. You're, you're, you're 10. You're not going to average 230 because she sees me striking. So I should be doing that. I'm like, no, you shouldn't. You know, when you get to the next level, teaching the basic rules and the governance and understanding. Talked about them here. You know, what you guys are doing at the high school levels, you're teaching the basic fundamentals. You've talked about the two-handed, the drilling technique. You've talked about the, um, you talked about the service uh, on the lanes, altering the service on the lanes. All those things that you're doing is you're educating those bowlers for when they get to the next step. Every level, as we said, build upon, build upon that first level going upwards. Then you teach them relevant skills and useful knowledge. Um, this is where you get into really the ball dynamics and drillings and stuff that I wish I really understood, but I just don't. Um, I say it all the time. My one weakness is I couldn't look at that balloon ball and tell you how to drill it any other way because I'd look at my, my drill pro shop guy saying drill is to do that, and they do that for me. Um, but those skills are skill sets. Reading a lane pattern, those things are out there. It's just so key in what we're teaching the kids out there. Reading ball, uh, ball motion, most important thing in my opinion. We've done a lot of things at the collegiate level, a lot of things at junior gold. Some people may like, some people don't like. But it's really just to get that knowledge for those kids uh, to understand ball dynamics and, and lane motion. And most of all, how to compete, how to take wins and how to take losses. Um, you know, you're going to lose. Not every one of us is going to win. There's one champion in the end. But it's how you build upon that defeat and how you build upon that for the following year. Uh, I talk about the things that I see in my kids. I say, you lost. You, you got beat by your six-year-old brother. What are you going to do the next game? I'm going to concentrate and bowl harder. Okay, that's great. So go out and do that. But you have to teach them to accept defeat. We're all going to lose at some point. It's so critical that they don't go out and get frustrated because they lose. It's the mentality we all have. It's just going to be at my, again, go, I refer a lot back to my kids because obviously they're special to me. My son's football team got beat 48 to nothing like two weeks ago by a team that was far superior. But at the end, that coach called him over and said, hey, you guys had six great plays during this game. He didn't go back and say, hey, you guys got beat. So you had six great plays. You put a single out and teach them something that they all did something good. Every kid wants what? Positive reinforcement. That's all they want. They want positive reinforcement of something they did good during that time frame because they lost. It's 
you know, you can't always win. Talk about uh, coaching down a short-term plan. And getting this into schools is a way to teach bowling at an early age. Uh, Kathy, which talked about a little bit earlier, uh, does a great job with this. She does the bowler's ed carpets. Um, it's, it's, I can't tell you how uh, underutilized and undervalued that program is. Bowler's ed puts that carpet in the lane and gives a PE coach a manual on exactly how to teach that class. And all these things that puts bowling along, baseball, football, soccer, tennis, all these other sports, that carpet puts it in there and gets them at top of mind right away. They develop a lot of interest just from that. We go out and actively do this. We go out and we gave 59 grants out. I think I was just telling Kathy uh, this year, 170,000 kids impacted by it in 21 different states. Um, if you have schools that are interested in it, again, there's a grant program for it. Let me know, we'll get you a form to fill out. It's so critical to get these carpets and these things inside of schools. This isn't a sales pitch. This is simply to develop bowling inside the school and get it there. Those curriculums help the TP teacher teach the sport. Uh, we've walked through this numerous times. We added a thing called STEMS into it, which was a critical piece to put in, which is science technology piece in there. Um, it goes into all those that schools are asking. Teaching the sport at an earlier age gets them more involved. And again, most kids know what sport they want to be in by the time they're 13. We don't grasp that enough. So in your end of it, uh, at the high school level, they already know if they want to be in baseball, basketball, or football, but they're dropping out. So this is always, again, it sounds bad to say this, but I'm honest, it's a good chance for us to uh, scoop in and swipe, or swipe in and scoop those kids up. Because a lot of those kids want to be in sports. They want to be part of a team. They want to be part of an activity. They want to be rep recognized by their school and their peers. What do we have? Uh, we have Bolopolis. Talked a little bit about it. Um, the, this is a DVD program. It's party supplies. It's a whole bunch of stuff. But really what it is, if you've never seen the DVD, go to YouTube, download them, watch them. There's some basic fundamental skill sets that you teach during this program. I know my, my kid uh, bowls in a league where they have, it's an FEC, but it has big TVs. They went in, played a thing. It showed them how to pick up a bowling ball, showed them where the foul line was. But my three-year-old daughter, or five-year-old daughter, my three-year-old son at that time, that was good stuff for them. That's, they get the, because it's cartoons. Kids love cartoons. It's a great thing to teach them with. Bowler's Ed got into that, uh, carpets uh, in the, in the uh, schools. You can take them out to fairs. You can take them out to a whole bunch of different places just to get the sport exposed. USA Bowling and Coaching. Um, it's a program that's sort of dear to my heart because the fact that it's something that's brand new for us. And while USA Bowling, it's just like Little League Baseball. It's a concept. It's all scratch. It's all Baker-oriented. Um, at the league level, you can do some team games. But if you didn't see it, and some of you may have, the team from Indiana won this year. Uh, the gentleman brought together four kids, five kids from the state, from the middle school program. They came in and won the first national championship. Uh, pretty cool in my, in my eyes. This team that they bowled against actually had a girl who was from Washington. She flew in and bowled with the, their team. This is a program that is key to development because it is all about scratch bowling. It's all about uh, getting them out of lanes. But it's also your feeder system to your high school bowling where you just said your state championship's all Baker. That's the way this is when you get to the national finals. We do 16 different events. There's one here. Bring some kids. Let them know. Um, I'll be here running that event in, uh, in November right before Thanksgiving. But again, not a sales piece, but it's also just a great piece to trigger those kids and get them used to the Baker system. Middle school kids and younger kids aren't used to it. There's a U15 and a U12 division. High school bowling, that's what you guys all do here. Um, the fundamentals are set up for college bowling. Junior gold, uh, this is gigantic. I mean, I took it over in 2009. There were 1,648 kids who were bowling it. Last year, we had 3,292 kids come to Indianapolis. You'll get the statement that it's too big. It's never too big. These are kids who are bowling from April through July, where they have the avenue to go out and play baseball, softball, do all these other sports. But what they're doing, they're getting prepared for junior gold. So you're keeping them, them in a the center. You know, Dan did a great job, I can tell you, of this summer of getting kids development with, with Nick and those guys, of getting kids prepared for it. But that is such a key piece to development, the things that they do. Collegiate bowling, uh, I love collegiate bowling probably more than anybody because it's just what my passion is. Uh, set a record this year, 203 schools as members with USBC Collegiate. Uh, NCA has programs out there, you know, if somebody just posted the other 77 schools. There's NEI, which has about 40, 45 schools. It's just a great brand. If you've never been around it, it's, it's high school bowling on steroids to me. It's because you get them out there, and it's just because of the television and the television pieces we have, all those things that we have. It's just such a cool piece to it. Um, scholarship opportunities are abundance. Um, I have been told numerous times, especially on the women's side of it, that they are always desperately looking for female bowlers. 
to me that's sad because we have you know 100,000 kids bullying and youth bullying. We have you know 60,000 kids bullying and high school bullying who may not be members of USBC, which is fine because all we care is they're out bowling. But there's so many schools that come to me and say, "Can you get our word out that we're trying to give girls scholarships to come bowl?" But yet what they're doing is they're pulling from you know they're they're pulling kids from other sports on the teams or they're pulling a kid off campus just to fill a team. Uh, kind of sad to hear that, but it's it's still a tremendous sport. Uh, USA Bowling 101, uh, it's just a basic fundamentals piece. This is something that we kind of we talk about the evolution or um, development piece. What we do is we introduce the kid to a sport. We set basic goals, give them positive learning experience. Psychology is another piece that people really don't get. You know, Dr. Dean, we talked about, is probably the premier guy in sports for psychology for bowling. And they're being a role model, how we as a coach or how we as a, um, a person is a role model. The nice thing about USA Bowling, it's one coach for every team. It's not... Again, where I grew up, it was one coach for 70 kids, so two coaches for 100 kids. It's just not that. It's one coach for every team with a practice. The mission statement through USA Bowling Coaching is we'll teach game, sport, and activity bowling in a way that passes on the knowledge in the game through instructors, volunteers, to the youth of today. Um, USA Bowling Coaching, if you've not done it, uh, there's a lot of high school state athletic associations, sorry, high school states uh, with varsity bowling or club bowling that are actually hosting these seminars to train their coaches. I would recommend if you've not done one or you've never gone through it, reach out to me. We'd love to work with you guys and get one set up in this area uh, to have it done. Well, we just did two up in Mich or two up in Iowa. Uh, we've done some in Texas, but we're training all those coaches because as much as you guys all have a great skill set, there's obviously we know there's other coaches who are just there to be administrators. They aren't taught the sport. We want to teach the sport to the people. We did 60. We do 60 free seminars a year. You get a free level one certification once you fill out the survey. Stevens Group and those guys, it's, it's a tremendous uh, piece that you get. You get certified. It's nothing better than going to a parent and saying you're a certified coach for anything. Uh, it just teaches the basic fundamentals for the sport. Early development uh, are the pieces that we do. Collegiate and junior gold, I'm going to kind of combine those two because it's uh, some of the similarities that we do with these. Um, talk about uh, skill development, the pieces that we're doing. Controversial or not, these are things that I firmly do believe in. Uh, we do not show lane patterns at junior gold. We do not show lane patterns at the, at the collegiate championships. All throughout the season, it's not fine and dandy. They can do that. But during the postseason and all those other things we did, we do not show the patterns. The reason why we do that, educate the kids, ball motion, ball dynamics, get into coaches after a break where they can alter the surface in between a break. All those things it teaches the coach. It also gets them to go out there. It's just a nice thing. We've, first, we got you know, complaints, complaints about it. It's been slowed down a lot for the piece. Junior gold. 3,292 kids. Uh, being the guy who's overseas, I thought I would at some point get yelled at by somebody throughout the tournament. I didn't get asked one time by any certain player or any certain co or dad or parent or anyone from the stands, which is 11,000 people, anything about playing patterns. Didn't even post them. So I thought that was kind of interesting this year. We limit bowling balls down to five bowling balls. Um, it's just, again, ball dynamics, making sure you have the right drillings, all the layouts. Uh, a big one we just changed just recently for like the US Open and for college bowling. We don't allow for alterations during practice. Uh, a lot of times you'll lay out a pattern and uh, scuff, 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 and then all they do is they're destroying the integrity of the pattern. So one of the things we did, we're trying to do is protect the integrity of the pattern, and we'll see how that works out. And also you're training for the future. Junior gold and college both are for Team USA purposes, for junior Team USA purposes. <laughs> Recruiting. Um, I don't know if this is something you guys have got into at all, uh, with talked about it a little bit ago with all the NCA programs, all the NEI programs, all the collegiate programs are out there. Um, you're going to start seeing it if you haven't already. You're going to start seeing uh, coaches wanting to talk to you about their players. What's the player's attitude when he's on the lanes? Because they want to talk to you. If you read over most of the sports, you follow basketball. I'm an IU guy, so I follow IU basketball like religion. Um, you know, they're talking to high school coaches. They're talking to the, this, uh, the principal at the school, they're talking to peers, they, but those pieces are you're going to be getting involved in if you haven't already. They want to know about the kid. They want to know what the kid's like as a leader in the lanes or off lanes because all they can see is that within that con or within that set T area when he's bowling, they have no idea what he's like in practice or she's in like practice. They want to know how that kid's being there. But as, a, as a recruiter, you help research the school. College bowling is great, but education's better. Uh, I am fully driven towards education. I get calls all the time. I've got a 1.97 GPA. Will you round that up for me to 2.0? No, we're not going to round up your GPA. But in that piece of it is, you know, I, I have no qualms or issues with just being blunt to a kid saying, you don't go to school for bowling. You go to school for an education. 
If you want to be a business major, you probably don't want to select certain school in here. If you want to go to be an engineer, you probably want to select here because those programs are just top-notch programs. You guys can help research that for your student athletes. Education over competition, said it before. Um, you see so many kids wanting to go to a school because it's a brand name. Um, but in the end, what you need to really look for is what they want to major in. I get at least 15 to 20 requests a year for transferring because, oh, they don't have my major. Well, what were you going to major in when you went there? Well, the same thing I'm going to major in now. Well, shouldn't have you checked that before you left? Before you went there, went 1,000 miles away? We get that question a lot on our end of it. They want you to talk to the college coach. I would tell you, you guys do the same thing. You know that kid better probably than anybody. Their practice habits, their skill sets. You would probably want to get a feel for that coach and see if he's a good match uh, for the player. You see the parents come involved. Parents are typically with dollar signs. What's the school going to give me scholarship-wise? But in the end, you also have to get look the look the evaluate and say, am I going to pay $35,000, get $5,000 from a school? So a scholarship may not always be the best option. It's also going back to education. Pitch it all the time. Talk to the parents. I mean, this is critical because the parents, uh, you guys don't have any problems with parents, right? You never, <laughs> never question your decision, never ask you and say, my kid needs more playing time or any of that stuff. Uh, if you do, then you're doing one heck of a job because I hear it all the time. But talk to the parents, bring them out and keep them educated, keep, them, keep a reality check. You know, my kid, my tell you what, my six-year-old son, he is the best football player in the country right now as a six-year-old. You know why? Because it's my kid. But in the end, he's not the best six-year-old football player in the country right now. But again, that's something you have to put a reality check on the parents. And what is the reality for their player? Maybe it's not to go off to XYZ school that's been a national champion. Maybe it is to go to XYZ school that's been competitive because they're going to get playing time. In the end, the parent wants playing time, the kid wants playing time. But first and foremost, are they going to get a good education from that school? And will they get any playing time? That's something you guys can invest your time into looking as well. Uh, thank you guys for everything. Uh, you have any questions for me before Stephen goes on? Yes, sir. Um, the USA Bowling Coaching Clinic that you put on, uh -huh. how do you uh, find out about that? You go to, if you go to bowl.com, you can look under USA Coaching. There's 60 of them a year. Um, they are scheduled throughout the end of the year. Uh, we do about, it's about classes of about 30 people. We actually give you a 140 page manual on how to set up practices, how to set up organizational structure to it. It's a, it's a really cool program. Um, I tell you, I'll give you, I'll give you all my cell phone and my numbers and stuff in a second here, but reach out to me. We'll work with you guys on it. Um, you now we started working a lot with um, high school coaches associations because again, I'll go back to it and don't take this the wrong way. A lot of the coaches are administrators. Um, they don't have the skill set or basic bowling knowledge, and we want to give them that basic bowling knowledge. You guys have taken the first step. Obviously, you're actively here. That means you guys are active within the community. But there's, I think he said, 300-plus schools. That just means those 300 schools either couldn't be here or maybe they're just not as active as you. But we set up two in Iowa this past year. Um, Texas has reached out to us to do all of the state of Texas, and it's a pretty big state, to do some things around there where they're going to provide pay for it or do something for it uh, with the state. But just reach out to me. Um, Bull.com, go to USA Coaching. It'll have a list of, of all, the, um, all the seminars around the country. I'm not sure when the next one is here. I can look that up and give it to you if, if there's one on the schedule. Yes, sir. I'd just like to let everyone know if you weren't around the team to go this year, they put on a great tournament. And if you have kids that don't do junior go, being in the center, there were a lot of college, college coaches in the centers watching the bowlers. It's a great opportunity. Great experience. Uh, next year is in Cleveland. Cleveland, Ohio. Seven bowling centers, 48 lanes being the smallest one. <laughs> yeah, we gave out, you know, we, I can tell you I had 46 coaches at one coach's meeting, I had another 40 at another, and then so I would estimate probably 100 coaches there across the board. The NCA coaches, people always say, why can't they talk to us? But they have a re restriction that once registration starts, they can't talk. We do a complimentary booth at Junior Gold for all the college coaches. Anybody who wants one, as long as we have space, which now we're in convention centers, that's how big it's got, uh, has become. We actually had, I think, 43 college teams where the kids can create and give them bowling resumes. There's another uh, application or a program that we have on there called the Next Step brochure. It's called uh, Next Step. Um, it talks about how to get that kid prepared for college. It is a tremendous piece for those who have never seen it. A big misnomer for with this college bowling side of it is they see what's on TV. They see the two kids that from, you know, from this local area. They see Jeffrey Mann. They see Dustin bowling on TV and think they need to average 220. 
Um, they don't. The average college bowling average for the girls is 165 and the guys is 170. It's not as high as you think. We have two scales that we're putting in there. Historically, it's all been geared towards the female side of it on the front end. We're adding a scale this year for on the, on the guy side so we can just pre bring out that reality that it's not all as high average as you think it is. Um, so, but I do appreciate it, Randy. It's, it's, it's a beast. 3,292 kids through bowling center for, you know, four straight days of bowling. It's a lot of kids. Dan graciously hosted us this year. He can tell you it's a beast. So, any other questions? Again, I appreciate your time. Uh, Steven's going to come in and give you kind of a different perspective than I do because he is the expert in coaching. I'm just the guy who gets to talk about coaching. Uh, Steven's one of the 29 gold coaches in the, in, the, in the world. I mean, so you're looking at one of the most premier coaches in the world. He helped coach the Florida State bowling team. He's an assistant coach for Team USA, coached the team to a lot of medals at the Turn of Americas. Uh, he's you know, just a good guy all around in, in what he does. And I tell you what, you listen to him. He's got a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge. So give him a big round of applause. Just a second here, I'll get mic'd up. A lot of good information from Gary, um, and just in the presentations in general, but uh, something real quick I picked up from him from the first couple lines he talked about is that he was heavily involved in coaching um, as he was uh, a younger player. And through a lot of what he developed in collegiate, high school and collegiate, he kind of grew, come up through the ranks and he really enjoys his job. I share the same kind of responsibility. Uh, my parents were my first coaches. So from the time I could start throwing a bowling ball at two years old to the time I got into some leagues at six years old to the time I went to high school to collegiate and then up through um, some competitive play, I had uh, coaching. I was always involved in it. My parents were my first coaches. They got actively certified through a USBC, uh, actually at the time, uh, um, an ABC-WIBC program uh, that was one of the original programs. And uh, today, uh, in 2014, whenever I called my dad and said, hey, you know that program that you were part of whenever you taught me how to bowl? Yeah, I'm the director of that program now. It's kind of cool to share that experience with my folks. So I've kind of been in that same spot where, like Gary's coming from where I've had a great opportunity to, to really live what I get to do. And just like he said, uh, I'm very fortunate to get to do what I get to do and have had a great uh, experience along the way in my coaching career. Um, I've had a lot of fun doing it, and it's taken me around the world. I've had a ton of fun. Team USA, uh, my own personal bowling. My family's heavily involved in the sport as well. Gary's got 6 and 10. I've got a 4-year-old that's coming up. Um, she's a lot of fun. She likes to just watch the ball roll down the line. Doesn't care if he hits a pin. Just like he said, as long as they're having a good time. Four, four, game, 4 and 6, they're already bowling for that, that voucher and that, that money right now. Not yet. We, um, we do have a lot of fun with the sport, though. And what I was asked to share, when Gary first brought me into the, the process here and said, hey, we want to share some coaching information with this large group, um, I gave him about a dozen slides or so. And I said, here you go. Here's some good content. If you've got any questions, let me know. And he says, how about you come and teach this stuff? And I said, well, I got how long? He said, about 30 minutes. I said, yeah, that's going to take a little longer than 30 minutes for me to go through it. I said, my classes are usually what? Uh, my level one class is three to four hours. My, my bronze class is a two-day course. My, my silver class is a three-day course. I said, what can I possibly teach these guys in 30 minutes? It's really going to help them out. And uh, going through Gary's information and knowing what he was teaching, I'm going to dig a little deeper. I'm going to be a little more interactive if you guys don't mind, because I don't, I don't want you to sit here the whole time and just kind of listen. I want you guys to participate. So my first question out of the gate in my first slide is a pop quiz. You guys ready? Did you guys study? <laughs> I hear the giggles. That usually doesn't mean you studied if you're giggling. Okay. Question one, and it's a little small. I'll read them out loud here. How many boards are on the lane? 39, 39, 39. Anybody have a different number? Hope not. Right, exactly. I heard a 40 back there. Somebody says 40 every now and then, and I usually ask that question in my classes. And if you're not paying attention or if you've never done it, um, go, up, go out and count the boards. It's easy to do. There's 39 on the lane, right? That's an easy one. Okay, so everybody pass that one. We'll move on to the next one, right? How many dots are on one lane? Okay, I hear depends. I hear seven. I hear five. I hear... Okay, everybody's kind of picturing a lane in their mind right now, right? Okay. Okay, if I say how many dots on one lane, how about pass, let me be more specific. How about past the foul line? How many dots are past the foul line on one lane? Anybody? I got almost 80 coaches in here. You guys have to, you guys have to know how many dots are on the lane. One lane. How many? Ten. In the back of the very back of the room. Ten dots on a lane, right? One lane past the foul line, 10 dots, okay? 
We'll even get one more easier question. How many arrows are on one lane? Okay, seven's kind of popping up as that answer. This is basic information about your playing field, right? This is really, this shouldn't be the, the tough stuff. We shouldn't be digging into the, well, I'm, I'm kind of guessing at this. These should be kind of off the top of your head. And like Gary mentioned, I know there's a lot of people that maybe, and again, no offense, kind of the administrative side and not the bowling expert side, but when you think about the playing field, how many of us know how tall a basketball hoop is? Yeah, it comes right out of your mouth, right? What's the heaviest a bowling ball can be for competition? Easy one, right? What's the lightest it can be? That's the number one answer, but it's not the right answer. Is it eight for competition? For competition. Okay. Technically, if you look in the manual, there's no legal limit as to how, how light a ball can be. You can have one as light as you can make it, as long as it holds up as far as durability on the lanes. I usually walk around in my coaching classes and I'll have a four pound ball with me and I've got one that has, actually has a plastic shell and I've got all the holes drilled in it and that kind of stuff. It's kind of fun to demonstrate, but even knowing basic information like this as a coach, if you walk away from here and learn something today, minimally you're going to learn something about kind of the playing field and what's going on. Take your athletes, the ones that are coming to you for the first time, and guess what you need to do? Ask them these same questions, right? Question three. How long is it from the foul line to the, to the head pin? Somebody give me a confident answer. There we go. There's an answer that has a little bit of something behind it, right? 60 feet, foul line to head pin, right? Now, I could sit here all day long and ask you questions about the playing field and about the bowling balls and about the equipment. But ultimately, you are going to want to be an expert in that field because at some point, somebody's going to ask you that question, aren't they? Hey, coach, which, which arrow am I aiming at? Okay, why are the dots on the lane? Do they line up with the arrows? What board is the seven pin on? That kind of stuff. In fact, the questions that you're going to get past the pop quiz are going to be like this. Hey, coach, what are we working on today in practice? Now, that's not a specific question unless you actually are prepared to know that answer, right? How about, how do I get the ball to hook more? Anybody ever hear that question? Yeah, heads are shaking, right? <laughs> happens a lot. People want to know. I saw it happen on the, on the show. I want to know how to do it myself. So at some level and to some degree, you're going to want to at least have some knowledge of all these questions or a, a ton of questions. And, and I keep going here. Should I try the two-handed thing that's out nowadays? How many people are experiencing that with, with that type of player, with a two-handed approach player? Put a hand up if you're working or have worked with a two-handed approach player. It's getting big. It's getting really big out there. Really cool stuff. Et cetera, et cetera. All these questions, when it comes down to it for my, my quote unquote quiz, are just there to kind of remind you and kind of get your attention that, hey, guess what? It's nice to be a part of an administrative part of a program and or a coaching part of it, but if you don't have a working knowledge of what's going on, it's going to be difficult and you're going to limit what your player will learn simply because you don't have the knowledge or you're not looking for it. That's where we can help and that's what I'm going to help understand here. So I got a couple slides of more information, then I've got some more interaction as we go, but don't hesitate if you guys got any questions, I'll ask you to, to kind of save them to the end. We'll cover them for sure. Um, what does a coach do? And if I ask everybody the same question, you'd have your own specific answer as to what a coach does. In general, if we just look at the, the big scale, they help athletes identify and focus uh, on accelerating their success. So the quick definition, you make somebody better in some way. Hopefully you're making them better and not taking them the other direction, right? So a good coach, creates a safe environment where players see themselves more clearly. So if you can make it easier for the player to identify who they are and what they need to, to work on, you're doing your coaching job. Good coaches also identify the gaps where players are and where they want it and need to be. Somebody comes to you and your program and they, they want to become part of your team and they want to get better. No one wants to come to your team and go, well, I'm worse now than I was whenever I first started. Or I know more than the coach. How, many, how, how, how often does that happen? How many of your bowlers out average somebody um, on their coaching staff, right? My dad was my coach until I out averaged him by one pin. And then guess what? I knew it all, right? <laughs> Literally, I thought I knew it all because my dad was one pin less than average than me. And that's certainly not the truth. Obviously, he had a lot more knowledge and information. It's not about score. It's about how you present information and opportunity so that somebody has a chance to grow and be a better, better player. Uh, good coaches also ask for thought, action, and behavior. Um, behavior changes that players don't ask of themselves. Your bowlers come to you with a skill set and a game, and they want to get better, but they don't know how to get better. That's where your responsibility is going to jump in and help that. And until you know how to make them better, they're going to struggle with that. Your, all, your team's going to struggle with that. So it's a responsibility that you, at some level, will want to take internally and go, to what degree do I need information? 
A good coach is also a guide to structure accountability and support necessary for growth. So you're going to administratively and on the lanes physically start to do the things that help your players get better start to finish. Okay, so building a coaching brand. So you're a coach, you've got a program, you're involved. You're a powerful resource who can help players get out of their own way, stand out, and take action to achieve the things that are important. I'm basically saying the same kind of information in the last slide. You are that piece that people are going to look for. Hey, coach, how do I get better? Okay, what's the issue? What's the concern? Well, that's what I'm asking you, coach. Well, how do I get better? Well, you need to have some kind of system, some kind of working knowledge of how to help someone get better and troubleshoot what's going on. You don't have to be a bowling ball expert. You don't have to be a physical game expert. You don't have to be an expert on reading lane conditions, which I agree with Gary is one of the, the most challenging parts of today's game. But I think it's one of the most important parts. Techno technologies move forward, right? The balls have gotten stronger. The game has gotten more angular. Everything's starting to change. And the, the lane patterns change so fast nowadays. So if we're not on top of just learning how a bowling ball reacts or what happens as it goes down the lane, we're behind the curve of those that are learning it. And, and we're going to be we're going to keep continue to be behind them in the score sheets. So coaches, um, get clear about goals to train a player. Focus and focus on everything you can, including technique. Um, a good coach also helps identify blind spots, and that's when a coach that's when a player comes to you and asks, "Hey, coach, what do I need to work on?" You don't have to have an answer immediately, but you need to have a resource that helps you figure out what to work on. How many of you coach or use video when you work with your teams? Anybody? Put your hands up a little bit higher. Let me see this number real fast. How many know that there are free video options right now you can put on your cell phone, on your tablet, on your laptop that don't cost you a penny, that you can analyze video, slow it down, speed it up, email it, all that good stuff, and you have a coaching tool that is practically free to you at this point. Anybody have one of these things in their pocket? Who's been looking at them throughout the presentations? <laughs> yeah, I, I have done mine too. I've got my email over there going every now and then. 240 frames per second of high-speed video captured on the device in my pocket. The old coaching system used to be a camera on your shoulder. It used to be a VCR or a TV monitor next to you. It used to be this large system. Nowadays, everything I need for coaching is right here. I'll email you your lesson. I'll show you what we're working on. I'll slow your video down. I can capture at 240 frames a second the actual flicker of the bulb on the, the lane pin deck down there that, that lights up the pins because my camera's fast enough to do it nowadays. I'm not saying the technology is not out there for everybody to use, but if you're not using technology, you're certainly behind the curve of those that have taken a chance and taken the leap to go do it. If you have questions about those programs, there's obviously people around there that have access to those tools. I'll be here too. I'll be, I'm glad to touch base with you on what's available. Uh, coaches help enforce accountability. If you're not holding your players accountable, it's going to be difficult for you and for the player to see growth. That's what your job is as a coach. You have to hold them accountable. They got to have responsibilities. You guys have talked rules already this morning. You guys are a lot more accountable now, not just in the rules area, but hopefully in the coaching area by the time we're out of this room. Coaches also focus development using time and energy efficiently and effectively. How many of you have trouble scheduling your practices and getting all the things that you want done done in that time frame? I'll put my hand up too. It worked. It's difficult, isn't it? We got to get more effective and more efficient at doing it. Scale things down. Let the players ask the questions. Have information to feed back to them as much as, much as possible. Okay, a contemporary coach or a modern coach in today's, today's game. You're more than just somebody that stands out there and watches and throw the ball. Leader, communicator, educator. You're in public relations as much as you are on the lanes a lot of times. Um, you're a guide, you're a friend, a role model, you're a mentor, as well as an administrator, a coordinator, a technician. There, there's tons of adjectives I can give you guys, but you guys know your place already and kind of where you are. Learn where you could be more effective and build that into the structure of who you are as a coach, and your teams are going to benefit from that very quickly. A coach has to be open-minded. Anybody ever see a team or work with a player, and don't, don't say it out loud, don't call it out here, <laughs> but you know where that player has come from. You know their technique. You know who, whose program they've been a part of because it's maybe the same style or the same format. I see some smiles and heads nodding around the room. Yeah. Sounds like it's everywhere, right? That's okay. Nothing wrong with that. Be open-minded, though, because that player that comes to you and says, Coach, here's who I am. I want to learn about being a better player is going to need you to be open-minded and say, you know what, I don't just coach this way. Let's learn about this two-handed thing, or let's learn about how to get more rev revolutions on the ball. Let's learn about how to do play outside of the boards and not always in the middle of the lane kind of thing. So be open-minded. Be unique because it counts. Here's my example. I don't know what the number is. I have to get with Gary to find this out. But this is Chris Vai. He's a gentleman who's been on Team USA and the Junior Team USA program. 
two-handed player, <clears throat> very good kid, just actually competed this year at Tournament of the Americas with us in Florida, and uh, very successful. <coughs> Excuse me. And along the way, um, he was never really told, no, you shouldn't or no, you can't, because prior to him growing up and seeing it, there are players that have had this technique and this, this form. You guys know Jason Belmonte and Oscar Pularma and, and, and um, Anthony Simonson and all these kids now that are, are growing up with this technique and style. If somebody tells these kids, no, you can't, and that's all they believe, obviously this doesn't come around. But guess what? Fift we've measured 15 to 20 percent more ball speed and revolutions hitting the pins. What's the name of our game? Yeah. Knocking down the pins, right? Yeah. That's our goal. If we do more to those pins than somebody else does, guess what? Guess what made me mad when I watched Jason Belmonte ball? He gets the head pin to go to the wall and take the ten pin out at least twice a game, at least minimally, probably four or five times a game. I get it once a month, <laughs> right? Anybody else in that boat? I'm in that boat. My river is not near as close. My ball speed's a little slower. That all that good stuff. And to me, I'm going, that's not fair. And then I go, wait a minute. What do you mean it's not fair? He just does it differently. What's fair, right? Keep that in mind. Not a bad technique. We actually have material, too. <clears throat> in our bronze manuals, we've developed some content. And some of you that have been through, can I ask real quickly, how many are certified coaches through USBC, either level one, bronze, silver, or gold? Excellent. Great. We've got a lot of Indiana covered. That's awesome. Very cool. Um, excellent. So you guys have seen or heard that in our bronze manual, we have a section uh, dedicated specifically to the two-handed approach player. And we teach the stance, the start, the timing, the arm swing, what it looks like, all that technique. One of the first, country, one of the first programs worldwide that actually has a piece dedicated specifically to that technique because we know it's not only coming but it's already here so we got to start learning more about it we're going to we're actually in the process of developing more material for our silver classes too so anybody that's bronze and wants to go to silver or anybody that has these type of players i'm always interested in information you can have my contact information or details after we get done here but i want to know who you're working with and how it's going because i need more research and detail so i can start building it at a higher level at the silver and eventually in the gold level as well we got to learn about it even though it's new we got to get we got to know more Great player, uh, great, great gentleman, um, did very well for his country this last year in Florida as well, or this year in Florida. Um, coaches always have to grow and develop, obviously, your coaching experiences. So not just going to the bowling center, practicing, coaching your, your competitions, and then being done. Develop yourself outside of just the bowling field. Look at other sports. One of the other sports that we actually communicate with that we've done pretty well with USOC's information is that the two-handed bowling approach is a lot like a hockey player hitting a slap shot. If you look at the actual technique, the, tor the difference being they're on skates and we're on the floor. But if you look at the two-handed, they're actually delivering back and forward in the same type of motion, right? So we start to look at some of the similarities. What, how do you train that athlete? How do you get them to be more effective? What do you do to cross those barriers, so to speak? And ultimately, we learn from things around us. So as a coach, don't be afraid to look outside of your sport and find information. It's out there. Um, as a coach, you need a philosophy. You need words that you live by. If you think for just two seconds on, if somebody asks you what's your coaching philosophy, you could probably come up with a sentence to kind of describe who you are, how you coach. That's important and valuable for you to research that and know what that is. Because people are going to look at you and your program based on how you are and what words you live by as a coach. It's important. How important is winning? It's kind of a broad question, but if you think about it for a second, how important is winning anything, a competition, a tournament? winning my goal at the end of the day, which may just be making more spares than I did yesterday. Okay. Think of how much value you place on winning versus how much you place on development. And of those two, think about which one of those is more important for you or, and or your athletes. And I'll ask a question later on because i got a, an example I want to run by you guys. <clears throat> In developing your coaching philosophy, you need to help athletes develop physically, psychologically, and socially. Gary's touched base on this already. You guys are more than just a coach getting out there showing them how to knock more pins down. You're going to communicate more with their parents, with their friends, and, and developing them as a team so that they ultimately have better social um, and, and physical involvement inside the sport. Help players enjoy this sport. We're here to have fun. It's nice if we all hang out and talk information, but we get up in the, out of our chairs. And I think it's a little more fun when we stand up and talk because now we're networking. Things are moving a little differently. We're getting the information we need immediately. Same thing's going to happen in your competitions, in your practices. Gather information. Make it fun. Uh, your philosophy represents the words you live by as a coach. There's been some great coaches along the way. Anybody recognize this? I don't care about the content on it right away. I, I just know it specifically. Anybody know what it is? What is it? John, Wood John Wooden's, right, the basketball coach. Keys to success. This is a pyramid that he starts with. He basically says, here's how you start as an athlete. Here's where you go to be 
the greatest, so to speak. And it's a great little philosophy. Um, I encourage it. I think it's a great piece. There's tons of coaches with all kind of inspirational information out there. Um, don't hesitate to go and find something. Really look into what your philosophy is. Is it about winning? Is it about being a better coach? Is it about developing the athletes? It doesn't have to be specific to every single detail, but you need to know who you are, and people need to know how you coach because it'll make a difference. It'll make a difference in how they perceive you, how people reflect on you, and then who wants to be in your programs. And that can change. Don't get stuck in thinking that this is exactly how I am all the way. I'm telling you here, make it a broad stroke. Okay. All right. Gary talked about it earlier. I've got to bring it up. This is fun. I do this in the bronze class. Uh, it's a lot of fun real quick, and uh, it kind of fits the program here. Um, there's three basic types. We get this from information from psychological studies that happen uh, globally. Three basic types, types of coaching style. The first one, you guys recognize the, the coach here? Everybody should know who this guy is. They call it the command type where the coach dictates everything. This guy basically made you turn your brain off, and he was your brain, right? He said, you do this, you do it this way, no exceptions, no questions, all done. If I had a chair close, I would, no, I'm kidding, <laughs> right? Okay. Watch out. Watch out, right? Did he win? Yes. Did he win more than once? Yes. Absolutely. Did it work? Yes. I'm not telling everybody to go out there and throw chairs across the bowling lanes, but... It is a style. It is something that is effective. If it works and it fits and that's who you are as a coach, by all means. We don't encourage you to go out there and obviously be destructive to a degree. But if you need to take command of somebody as far as the approach, or as far as the game, as far as knowledge and information, that may be who they need as a coach at that time. Here's another example. Anybody know who this coach is? There's a small picture up here. Sorry for those in the back of the room. I need to blow it up. Billy this is yeah, Billy Bob Thornton. You guys remember the movie? What was the movie? Remember his name in the movie? What was it? I think it was Coach Buttermaker, right? Yeah. You know who he was? What was his coaching style? Kick back, crack a beer, and let him play, right? <laughs> That's who he was. Guess what happened to the team? They became a team, and guess what they did? They won, right? Now, on the movie theory theme, it's really, competitive, really kind of neat, and it works. But a submissive coach is still somebody that is coaching. So if you take a look at those two right away, does anybody fit? Any no, don't raise your hand. Never mind. Never mind. I don't need to know. Okay? Think about it, though. Who's this guy? Coach K, right? One of the most successful coaches in all of college basketball. I think this year he's actually stepping down from Team USA. He's going to allow another coach to go be part of that program. He fits more the model of what we call a cooperative coach. A cooperative coach uses a lot more interaction and involves feedback from the actual athletes. Gets their perspective on everything. Feeds back to them in their own technique and style. He's very specific when it comes to it. Okay? We encourage a cooperative coach style. We think it's effective. We think it's effective and positive for a lot of who, um, who gets to work and who gets to coach together. So consider any of these three, but all three of them are winners, right? Just take stock in who you are and where you fit. Make sure that you're molding and adapting yourself and your program to whatever's going to work for you and your teams. Okay? All right. I'll move it on. We're close on time. I don't want to get too far. Okay, good. All right. Coaching styles. Um, uh, as a coach, you're creating lifelong participants. Uh, giving prior instruction will create lifetime participants and ambassadors for the sport. The kids you coach today will be the athletes the world sees in the future. The kids that are coming out of here that made the CBS telecast that won the Junior Gold event that came out of Indiana are going to be the kids that are on our world stage coming forward. You're going to have the initial effect on these kids. Gary said it the other, just a minute ago. He said it great. He said, you guys are going to be the first ones that are helping these kids get to the next level. Take that to heart and think about how you're interacting with your kids because they're going to be affected by you, and they're going to, on a global stage, be seen by exactly how you've helped mold them to begin with. Take stock in that. Own that. That's going to be part of your legacy and theirs when they're on that world stage thanking their coach along the way. Okay? It's not about us getting thanked, though, is it? Coaching's a little bit thankless, isn't it? I can agree with that. We do it because why? We enjoy it. We love it. We want to give back, right? Tons of reasons. Okay. Um, also, as a coach, you need to be aware of a code of ethics. Put this into your repertoire. Make a note or at least scratch down these if you don't already have them somewhere in your, in your own information. Uh, we go by USOC's code of ethics, the Olympic Committee. Uh, competence, integrity, professional responsibility, Respect for participants, concern for others' welfare, and responsible coaching are very, very basic outlines of what we encourage for any coach at any level. Take a second if you've got a pen and write them down. They're very important. You can look them up online as well. They're not tough to find. You can go to USOC's website and find them. 
These are very basic coaching skills. Everybody should have a working knowledge of each one of these. They're a basic outline for how to teach someone or how to be effective in coaching and communicating. One more time, competence, integrity, professional responsibility. I'm not going to give you definitions for all of them. You guys can look them up. I think some of you guys are doing what I see people in our coaching classes do. Instead of writing it down, what do you do? Take a picture nowadays, right? Pop the phone up, zoom it in, click, done. I think my four-year-old daughter is never going to write a letter in her life. <laughs> she's going to type or she's going to take a picture, one of the two. Professional responsibility, respect for participants, concern for others' welfare, and responsible coaching. Okay, you got them? All right. Okay, as a coach, outside of just the coaching field, you have legal responsibilities. We see this pop up in coaching occasionally every year. Coaches often fail to supply a safe physical environment. You're responsible for policing the area when it comes to the environment, and not just the tournament area, but your practice area or any of your competition sites. Provide adequate and proper equipment. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to go out and buy a bowling ball for everybody. I love that Gary threw that in there. Get on top of what he's got going on for getting equipment to your area if you need it. But you're responsible as a coach for that equipment that is attached to those players. If you've got players on the approaches and their shoes are falling apart and they fall down, guess whose responsibility that is? Not just the player to say, oops, I didn't look at my shoes. The coach has got to be aware of that stuff. Legally responsible for that stuff. As a certified coach with us, we have a liability insurance policy for every member that's up to a million dollars. You guys are aware of that? Anybody, go to try, anybody else try to, anybody have ever tried to go find liability insurance as a coach or as a professional in the industry? Guess what a million dollars worth of liability insurance will cost you annually? You don't want to know. It's tough to make that many lessons, honestly, in order to get to that cost. Now, what you can do, though, as a certified coach with us, you become part of that program. You get that as a benefit of being a certified coach. So all you got to do, like Gary mentioned, get into either USA Bowling Program or you can get online. We've got level one programs that are all online. You can do them self-paced. All the testing's done there, too. You can do it at home sitting in your pajamas. It doesn't take very long to do. You can become a certified coach very quickly. And that includes that liability insurance and that membership in our coaches association. I'll give you more info as we move along. Uh, Legally, the duties also of a coach, supervise the activity closely, um, warn of any kind of risks. If you see something going on, the coach is responsible for saying, hey, there's water down here on the approaches. We've got to get this taken care of. Hey, there's something down here on, th on this floor that we have to, to make sure that we're cleaning up because our players are not safe at this point. Hey, get away from the ball return when that ball is shooting out because it's going to hit your fingers, whatever's going to happen. Coaches are responsible for that ultimately. Provide appropriate emergency assistance. How many of you are certified either in CPR or some kind of medical emergency information and assistance? Excellent. Easy to do. It doesn't cost much. A lot of times programs will help pay for that stuff because it's a benefit to the entire program. Okay. Uh, continuing real quickly, we're going to wrap up in a couple slides here. Um, risk management. Minimize potential dangers while creating a safe environment. There's four quick steps you got to do if you look at it really, really easily. Number one, identify what the risk is. Two, evaluate what it is. Okay, I see the problem. Now, what is the issue concerning my players? Next, determine what you got to do as far as taking the action. Do I tell the center? Can I go take care of it myself? Does the pro shop need to know? Does the lane mechanic need to know something? Ultimately, the last piece is make it happen. All this process needs to happen as soon as you identify some kind of a risk. Don't wait for something to happen for you to be liable for, a, for anything to, that, that could be a problem with you or the team. Okay. All right. So you're a coach. You've got responsibilities. You're liable for things. You've got a lot happening. You know a lot of what's going on. Market your coaching program. A lot of us do fundraising in here, right? I used to do a lot of that with the college program, with, with some of the high school teams I was working with. From the coaching standpoint, get bowlers to look at you as a coach. Make the bowling center stronger and more supportive by involving yourself, not just in the high school program. If you can do something for the center, reach out to them. A lot of times there's trade-offs there, and proprietors see the advantage of having a certified or active coach in their facility. You can bring more players into their facility. Now you're talking their, their language because each bowler to them or each person in their facility is worth a, an X amount to their, their bottom line. So as a coach, you can be responsible and help out those, those centers. Work in professional manners, be organized, keep good records, track financials accordingly. I'm not sure if that's um, as responsible for the coaching side of what you guys do in high school, but I'm sure there's somewhere along the line where you have to adhere to some budget or you have to keep track of what the team um, has to pay for, for buses or for food or whatever's going on. So make sure you're taking those pieces into consideration as much as possible because those are very important when it comes to the end of the year when they're evaluating processes and programs for the following year. I will mention this too. Um, I mentioned a little bit earlier about winning. Is it a priority for you as a coach? 
Has anybody ever been in a situation, and I'll put my hand up, uh, you don't have to raise your hand, but I'll just tell you my situation quickly. I was once told that if my team didn't win, we wouldn't have a program next year. Now, I see some, some, some heads kind of nodding, some eyes kind of shaking and moving. I literally was told that. I mean, the administrator looked at me and says, you got to win. If you don't win, we don't think we're going to support you. We're going to fund you next year. And I went, wow. I said, is this about winning or is it about my athletes getting better? And I made the kind of comparison. And I said, this is really should be more about the player than it should be about whether this program moves forward. It shouldn't be about winning or losing. Um, I will say that fortunately we were, we had won and done enough in the program to continue it moving, successful for many years. But it's a tough decision as a coach sometimes to kind of be put to something like that, wouldn't it be? Think about it for a second. Win or no program. Tough choice. Tough to try and coach under those circumstances, wouldn't it be? Got to win. Well, I don't control whether we win or lose. I get to control that my athletes have the best effort possible. Okay. Um, if you're not a pro shop operator, if you don't have access to one, immediately try to find one. Um, there's tons of operators out there. Uh, IPSIA certified operators are who we recommend for the coaching programs. There's uh, active lists on IPSIA's website. You can find that pretty easy. IBPSIA is the acronym. And you can find them pretty actively, pretty easily. They're certified um, typically when they're in that program or they pay membership to be a part of it, so they have access to information. Uh, seek out those coaches, look for those people as far as um, updating or, or getting information from the pro shop. Plus, the pro shop's a great resource for getting equipment or managing equipment when it comes to team play. From a business standpoint and in, in your overall responsibilities and relationships, um, other coaches, by teaming with other coaches on the lanes, you can create more opportunities through group sessions, camps, and clinics. Uh, this year and every other year, we host a World Bowling Conference where we bring coaches from around the world. We had almost 100, 94 this year, sign up and go to Texas with us. Um, there are combine events. I think Gary mentioned something about uh, some expos you can go to. We have a combine event. We have, uh, there's a collegiate expo that's up here toward the north, a little north of us here uh, in the Detroit area. There's tons of events that you can get to that will expand your coaching knowledge. I'm going we'll to give you some more resources here in just a second. From the team perspective, I asked a little earlier from you as a coach, is, it, is winning everything for your team? Well, it's certainly important, isn't it? It's fun when you win. Somebody's got to win, somebody's got to lose. It's sportsmanship whenever you decide how you're going to handle it. But ultimately, is winning what your team philosophy is about? Some people yes, some people no, right? I'm not asking you to choose. Just think about whether or not it fits your, your team and your criteria. How many of you have practice guidelines when you go and compete? First day of practice, here's what we do. Next day of practice, here's what we do. How many, have you, how many of you change or mold that as the practices go along? You have to. You better be doing it. You don't know who you're getting from year to year. You may know part of the team, but here comes the new crop of players that need some more adjustments, right? What determines who will compete in matches? Everybody in this room has a criteria for how they would choose a player for their competition. If you have seven players or eight or ten players, you only get to, to field five, I think it is. Is that correct? You field five on the lanes? That's what I keep hearing from the, the settee rule, right? Of those five, you've got to know which ones to plug in, when to plug them in. Having that outline, having that in your head, knowing when and how to do that kind of takes the decision out in the moment and, and lets the process just happen. So work on those pieces as a team coach outside of just you individually learning how to coach better. And then what are the team and program short-term and long-term goals? Make your athletes fill them out, make your administrators fill them out, and you personally write down what are my short-term and long-term goals as a coach and as a program for each of my individuals, for each of my administrators, for each of my, my assistant coaches, for myself as a, as a head coach, whatever the situation you're, you're in. Write them down, have them, check them often because you want to make sure you're working toward them. That's how you're going to build successful programs. Team chemistry is what we're all here to develop, everybody. That's what we're kind of doing here too. We're kind of networking, right? You guys have come from all over the state to figure out how to get better and not just coaching but learn about how to get better in general. Team chemistry is the ability of players to get along, work together under the leadership of the coach or coaching staff. These are the collegiate champions from this last year. There's only one high school champion, right? Well, sorry, there's one for different divisions and conferences, I guess, but ultimately there's one state champion. The team, I, I would be willing to bet you that the team that has the best team chemistry is probably going to come out on top this year and then next year and the year after that because they'll find a way to make it work. So I go back to what was asked originally. Somebody says, okay, talk about why coaching. And here's what I come up with. It's one, one sentence. It was really easy. Why coaching? Because it matters and it makes a difference. Everybody's here. Anybody getting rich and retiring off of coaching high school, high school bowling? I'll put my hand down because I'm not. I coach at some of the highest levels. I coach our national team to competitions and medals. I coach 
uh, international programs. I coach players that are just interested in coming in and spinning whatever it takes to be better. And I'm not retiring. I'm doing what I love to do, and I enjoy getting into my work every day because it's passion. It's what I, what I love. It's what I get to do. Hopefully, you guys will share the same responsibilities and passions as you develop and grow your programs. So if you're interested in becoming a coach, we already kind of give you some guidelines as far as level one, maybe USA Bowling program. Uh, we offer online courses and in-person. We have level one, bronze, silver, and gold are our four categories for, USA, uh, for USBC coaching. Um, I recommend the USA Bowling coaching program. Uh, if you would like to take level one for free and don't want to pay for it, but you want to become certified, USA Bowling is the way to start. Find one of the classes they've got in their schedule, attend that class, and then we offer free level one certification to anybody that attends and, and goes through the entire USA Bowling coaching course. If you don't take it on that free method, we have it online. Uh, you can pay for it. On, it's, I think it's 49 bucks is what we got it at right now, but you can take it online. It's all self-paced. All the information is there. You do the testing online as well. You can easily just become certified in that, that realm as well. But save yourself 49 bucks. Attend the USA Bowling coaching class. Come see us. We'll get you hooked up into level one. From level one, you decide where you want to go. Do I want to go more to bronze, more to silver? Everything is compounded. We do larger programs. We have larger time frames. They have more information. Everything's a lot more in depth. Our gold level coaches are our national team representatives, so to speak, or the coaches that we would comfortably recommend to anybody on the globe saying, this coach knows enough about the sport that we can get them involved in your program and make, make your team better. Okay. Uh, currently, we have a network of over 7,300 USBC certified coaches that are active in the sport with us. Uh, we have regional development facilities that have trained instructors to teach these co courses for us. Um, currently, it's the International Training and Research Center, uh, Kegel Training Center, TurboTech, Storm. We've got Bowler Smart, who has a large pro shop chain with certified coaches. Uh, Kieran Pullman, who is one of our gold coaches in the Utah area. And then uh, the um, it's uh, Bowling Pro Shops Incorporated. Sorry, Better Bowling Pro Shops. It's uh, Mr. Puerto in St. Louis. So we have seven facilities, basically, that we have certified instructors in. We can get a coaching class to you if you're interested in having information or get you into a coaching class. Easy to do. We can make it happen. We have online resource center that's going to be updates and information to all of our content. And then we also have our online testing site. All of our testing now is, is covered online. You don't have to sit in the class and take a test on paper. Everything is done electronically. You log in, you log out, you create an account just like you would if you're renting a car or flying, uh, flying someplace and you've got an account through one of the airlines. It's pretty easy to do. Everything is monitored and moderated. Our credibility and our, our programs are recognized worldwide. We're one of three programs that the World Bowling Coaching, or the World Bowling Program uh, that globally represents bowling in the U.S. Olympic effort, recognizes as a certification program. They offer it as much as possible to anybody that's interested. So our Level 1 program is part of that as well. So you can be a certified coach today when you leave this class at tonight if you're interested and be part of that program if you're not already. Bowl.com slash coaching is our site. If you have a question at all, coaching at bowl.com is the email address. It's the easiest way to reach us. Uh, there are a couple of us in the department down there, and we're glad to answer anything we can for you, anything and everything. If we can't get an answer immediately to you, we get you to the right department or get you where you need to go for information. Okay. Last ones. Gary mentioned some great programs from the youth department. Uh, we also have some other coaching programs through BPAA. Uh, Welcome to Bowling Program is a, a Kickstarter program that proprietors can get involved in. USA Bowling, I put that on there because it's really important. You guys get involved with that as much as possible. USBC Bowling Store has resource materials. We have uh, the psychological books. We've got the, uh, the mental game, the physical game. We've got tons of materials that other coaches have uh, sent to us for information, for resources, and they're purchasable online. We also have exercise training guides. How many of your teams actually exercise before they get on the lanes? Excellent. Good. More than the last couple of years when I've asked the question. Very cool. Uh, Boeing 2.0, a, a great proprietor uh, piece that actually gets people involved that may not be in youth bowling, but in adult bowling, just getting started. And then our bowling academy. Is anybody a member of the USBC Bowling Academy? Online subscription series or you get the DVD series? Those are awesome. I'll tell you what. Our, our, almost our entire gamut of goal coaches have gone through this series and have offered information up. And this is one of the most comprehensive, easy to use pieces when it comes to coaching bowling nowadays. It's easy to get on your, your phone, your tablet electronically. It's easy to take onto the lanes and demonstrate pieces and properties very quickly. And it's really inexpensive. It doesn't cost much to get online and make it happen. OK. Here's a quick example of what the, one of the pages might look like as far as video production. Um, you name it. Equipment, spares, physical game, lane play, mental game, off the lanes. We do tons and tons. There are hours and hours of video, hundreds of hours of video of current information about the game that you can easily log on to and have literally right there in your chair right now. 
Look, look at Bowling Academy if you're not familiar with it or used to it and become part of the program. I think I covered it, Gary. I think for now, I think I've got it. I'm sure there's going to be questions. Anybody have any questions about the content I've covered or anything specifically? Because I think we're right up against lunch, right? Okay. Questions? Anybody? I answered every coach's question in the room in 35 minutes. There's no way. Okay, well, thank you again, uh, the Indiana High School Program. I appreciate you guys having us here. Thank you for letting me spend my time. I'm here with Gary. We're here to answer some questions and get details. If you have any questions, let us know. Thanks again. Uh, I want to thank Gary and Steve both uh, doing a tremendous job of bringing some information to you guys that uh, I really feel is real important for your development along with your programs. Uh, the things that USBC is doing as far as getting the information out to our coaches or out to the proprietors or out to our junior programs, you know, they're doing a tremendous job in trying to grow these things. And it's guys like this that are putting in the time and effort to do that uh, that is making the program so successful. So, yeah, please listen to what he's got to say because it is so important for you to develop as a coach to make sure those athletes that we're coaching will move on to do better things. Okay, it's not just about bowling. We want those athletes to be better people. In order to do that, you need to educate yourself to help educate them. So guys, thanks a lot. I appreciate it very much. I know you're gonna stick around for a while. Um, please ask them questions. Uh, Mr. Beavers, do we have our lunch set up? Okay, what we're gonna do is take a little bit of a lunch hour here. We'll make some changes up here and everything's back there on the table, so we'll enjoy your lunch for right now. Thank you guys. Your sign up there. Thanks a lot.
Uh, okay, first thing I need to do is thank our sponsors. Uh, Dave Watka from EDI donated several of the bowling balls. Uh, fortunate enough that my daughter's on uh, Rotogriff staff, not the one that's here today, but my other one, uh, was able to pick up some bowling balls from Rotogriff and Storm for us. I appreciate that very much. And Scott Savage from Savage Bowling also donated several of the bowling balls. Uh, I want to make sure that those guys get credit, and I'll make sure they get the names of all the winners, so that way you know, they know I actually gave them to you. All right. Okay, next up on the agenda, I've got Scott Savage here from Savage Bowling. Scott's a, a silver level coach. He's also a, uh, the former Purdue University bowling coach. He owns several of the pro shops around the state of Indiana here, including the one over at All-Star. Uh, it's been great working with Scott these last couple of years, especially since he's been involved in our pro shops. Um, he's also a member of our Score 60 team and helps us out with a lot of the clinics that we do. And it is my pleasure to introduce Scott Savage to you. Now, I don't know if you can turn that back on or turn it off. <laughs> I'll figure it out. I'll get this here in a minute. All right. There we go. There we go. You hear me now? All right. Oh, that's, that's bright. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, college bowling and more specifically how to help your student athletes uh, connect with college coaches and how to prepare them to be ready for college bowling and for that recruitment process. Um, hopefully all of you um, you run a great program as far as preparing them on the lanes and preparing them for competition but we want to get you thinking a little bit more about helping prepare them for that college uh, application process and that college recruitment process. Um, like Gary and Steven talked about earlier there are a lot of opportunities out there for scholarship um, both at the NCAA uh, for the women, um, NAIA um, for women and men and even at the club level, don't discount a team just because it's a club team. Um, I come from a club uh, background, and there are club teams that give scholarship. Uh, but even more than that, there are a lot of club programs that can give um, more than just the scholarship. They can give the student the education they need, which is the number one thing that you need to be uh, preparing these students for. Okay? Um, with this talk, it's going to be a little bit, it may be a little bit strange uh, in the way it's set up. The first part is geared towards talking to you as coaches. The second part is geared towards talking to you, talking to your players. Okay, you communicating to your players some of the do's and don'ts, what to look for, and what to do, that sort of thing. Okay, and then the second part of the presentation, um, different topic is uh, I was charged with also talking about Baker games. I know there's going to be a lot uh, more emphasis on Baker games uh, this year in high school competition, which I think is fabulous. Um, collegiate bowling is all about Baker games. Uh, Baker games put much more emphasis on uh, the team and not the individual, which I think is much needed at the high school level. All right, so ready, ready to dive into this? All right, good deal. So the first thing, before we connect these players or these student athletes with a college coach, we've got to prepare them. Okay, so we've got to help. One of the things I'd like to charge each of you with is having each of your student athletes create a bowling resume. Okay? And what do I mean by a bowling resume? Anybody? Let's have some interaction here. Okay? So, accomplishments, what they've done on the lanes is very important, right? So, what they've done at the high school level, what they've done uh, even if they, you know, if they had success at the middle school level, what they've done at TKOs, uh, what they've done at other uh, junior gold, any other tournaments like that. That's definitely important. Also, though, there's other things that you want to have on that bowling resume. As a college coach, we look at much more than just your accomplishments. I could have a team of bowlers that is hands down 
you know, 300 bowl, you know, they bowled 300s, they bowled 800s, that sort of thing. They've got the skill level, they've got the bowling part down, but that doesn't make the best team. So we're looking for a lot more than just the bowling. So what are some other things that you can include on that resume? GPA, GPA very good. Could, sorry. I was going to say outside activities, you know, volunteerism. Yes, definitely. Outside activities, you know, if they're involved in any uh, club um, activities within their school, uh, volunteer activities, um, anything like that, that is great because we want well-rounded individuals. Okay? We want team players that are going to come in and look at the bigger picture, not just, can I throw a 300 today? Okay? Bowling videos. Help them prepare some bowling videos that they can send to the college coaches or get to the college coaches. And we'll talk about several ways you can get those to them. What are, uh, there's two key views. You can, go, you can do more, but there's two, at least minimum of two views that you want to get. The back view and the side view, okay? And when you do the side view, you want to make sure and film from the throwing side. So if I'm right-handed, okay, I want the camera to be over there to see the full approach, see the swing. If I'm videotaping from over here, then I'm not going to see as much, okay? And also, with that, if they're right-handed, please film them on a right lane. That way the ball return doesn't get in the way, okay? So we need, a, at minimum, a back view and a side view. And we're going to talk a little bit in, uh, in a minute as far as where, how we're going to get those to the coaches. Next thing, we want to prepare them with their skill development. Okay, and what do I mean by skill development? Okay, do we want them all to strike every shot? Of course we want them to, but is that realistic? No, not realistic, right? So we need to develop skills beyond just throwing strike shots. Okay, if your practice regimen is just to have the kids throw strike shots over and over and over and over and over, playing the same part of the lane, same ball, same release, same everything, Unfortunately, the honest truth is you're not preparing them for college bowling, okay? And you're not, really not preparing them for bowling in general, okay, at a, at a higher level. So we want, we want you to help them develop the skills they're going to need at that higher level. Spare shooting. Spare shooting is a premium. On our college conditions, we, I mean, they're tough. They're difficult patterns. The strike percentage um, for an average, well, an average competitive player uh, is probably 40 to 45 percent on a on a good day. Okay, that's probably high for the, uh, the majority of programs, but on a very competitive team, 40 to 45 percent. That means they're sparing more in the course of a game than they're striking. Right? So spare shooting is huge. Also, preparing them to be able to play different angles. I think Stephen touched on this a little bit. Uh, preparing them to play outside part of the lane to the inside part of the lane. Okay, we. We bowl six games, five, six games typically on the course of a first day in a tournament. Um, and I can speak uh, as far on, on the men's side. You know, we start right, and by the end of the day, we are very far left. Okay, we are, it's not uncommon to be um, left of fifth arrow. Uh, it's not uncommon to be targeting 30, 35. Okay? Um, and so you've got to prepare them to be able to play those extreme angles. And also to the right, there are some uh, tournaments that will put out shorter patterns where you've got to play them to the right. And it's Nick in the room. No, there's Nick's a trickster. He actually uh, puts out some patterns sometimes that are 50 feet in length and you still have to play them to the right. And so, um, you know, so you've got to be able to play all the different angles, all right? So skill development is important. Also important is mental preparedness. It's a tongue twister. What do I mean by that? Being able to keep your head in the game. You know, if you open, you should be able to keep your head right there. Make sure that you can make those shots time to time. Yeah. Definitely. Consistent head in the game mentality, right? Staying in it no matter what. Confidence. Confidence. Very good. What else? Being able to see your shot on the lane. Okay. Reading the lane, reading your shot. Yes, definitely. What's the difference, though, the big difference between your Saturday morning league bowling in high school or college? Ten hours. <laughs> Not time-wise. Okay, so we're going from an individual aspect or mentality to a team. Okay, that's very different. And we've got to prepare them for that difference. 
We've got to get them to think more as one as opposed to, you know, as to, uh, one team versus what I did. Okay? Does it make sense? So uh, prepare them mentally is important. All right? So now once we've prepared them, now how do we connect them with the coaches? Okay? First thing is research the teams, right? Go to a tournament or go on to collegebowling.com or go on to USBC. Uh, dot com, or I'm sorry, bull.com, uh, backslash collegiate, I believe it is. And, you know, they've got a list of all the programs listed by state and by scholarship opportunities. Um, and then look them up by email, okay? Or, or email them. I will give you guys one caveat. Once we get into the season, do not, uh, you need to be patient, okay? Um, we're very busy preparing the team, and sometimes uh, some coaches are better than than others on this, but replying to email may not be a, you know, 15 minute process. You may not send an email and then 15 minutes later get a reply. Just giving you a heads up on that, okay? But at the same time, don't be afraid to be persistent, okay? If you haven't gotten a response within, you know, a day or two, email them back, okay? Be persistent. One coach is probably being inundated with 10, 20, you know, some of the other, you know, some of the programs like Wichita State, they're probably being inundated with hundreds of emails about recruiting okay so keep that in mind Facebook don't be afraid to connect with Facebook okay look for the coach send them a private message um, a lot of teams nowadays have a Facebook page uh, it's a great source for information on the program as well as the coach um, send them a message through Facebook now the one caveat there is that if you're not friends with them on Facebook the message doesn't always show up on their end okay so if you send them a message and they haven't gotten back right away on that, um, send them an email, let them know you sent a message, or even, you know, right to their wall. You know, hey, I sent you a message, take a look, okay? Um, or YouTube. YouTube is a good place to um, provide those links for the videos, okay? Uh, it's pretty easy to create a channel um, for your bowling. So if you create a YouTube channel, you know, for the individual player or for the team, um, I've, I've seen some um, pretty progressive uh, high school coaches create a YouTube channel for their team and they upload videos for their players and then they can share links of those videos to the college coaches and get them out there to them that way. So use, use your resources, uh, you're online there. Snail mail. Also, we can snail mail, okay? So send the coaches a letter, send them that resume that we created earlier, um, those videos that we created earlier. Send those, make a DVD. It's really easy to burn a DVD nowadays. Um, that's, this is actually probably the way we did it about 10 years ago. Now, nowadays, it's more about the YouTube and sending the links. Okay? But if, you're, if, you, if you don't have access to that or you're not sure how to do that, snail mail still will get to the coach. Okay? And the last two things are more events that you can go to to connect with your coaches. Uh, tournaments, um, scholarship tournaments, um, as well as your high school tournaments and different things. Oftentimes there are coaches there uh, looking at players, looking for, you know, looking for potential recruits and that sort of thing. Uh, and then the last thing is once you've uh, found a school that, you, that you're interested in, hopefully from an academic standpoint first and for foremost, then see if they have uh, any kind of camps or clinics or anything like that. That's a great way to really get to know uh, what the school's like, what the coach is like, in a more in-depth, um, you know, on a personal basis. So we're going to talk about those a little bit more in-depth here. So tournaments. Like I said, you've got your high school, you've got your state and local tournaments. Um, you also have your local scholarship tours. These are really key, okay? So your TKOs, your alphabet soup, NWIJTPA, is that? Yeah. Um, tournaments. I make fun, but that is a great opportunity uh, to get your kids involved. Those tournaments um, prepare your students better than any other when it comes to preparing them for college bowling and junior gold. Okay. Um, next, you've got junior gold. Junior gold is probably the uh, mecca of connecting with college coaches. Um, I don't know of any college coaches with a reputable program that do not attend Junior Gold. I could be wrong there a little bit, but for the most part, you, uh, every college coach is there. Uh, you know, maybe not the whole week, but at least at some point during the week. Um, and then also with Junior Gold, we're going to talk a little bit more. There's an uh, opportunity for a collegiate showcase um, where the uh, 
we'll talk a little more here in a minute about that. Um, also, Teen Masters. Teen Masters is a good opportunity. Um, uh, Gary Beck with uh, Killer Bee Promotions uh, gives the opportunity for the students to uh, compete using just two bowling balls. Um, so you really, it's really demanding uh, lane conditions, and basically the, the student athletes have to learn uh, to manipulate ball roll to score. So that, that prepares the student for college bowling um, from a skill development standpoint very well. Okay, so the, and there's coaches there as well that you, you can connect with. I'm sure there's others. Anybody else have some examples of tournaments uh, that are good for the kids to go to? I know uh, Ohio has the JTBA, Michigan has the MJM, M, MJMT, something like that. <laughs> Michigan Junior Masters, MJMA, yeah, that's what it was, yeah, M, MJ. Uh, Illinois has the Illinois Youth Scholarship Bowlers Tour. Um, Kentucky, I'm not sure if they have one. But there's definitely a good opportunities out there, so uh, make sure you look those up and, and attend some of those. Okay, while you're at a tournament, some do's and don'ts. This is more for your players, okay? Do talk to coaches, okay? And be polite, you know, be friendly. Don't be intimidated. College coaches are people too, okay? So now with that being said, if you're in the middle of competition and you're, you're trying to score, you're trying to do well, also you can, you can tell them, hey, you know, I'm competing right now. Can we talk afterwards? Most college coaches are pretty respectful of that and don't try to interrupt you during uh, play. Uh, but there are some college coaches out there that are more aggressive than others, and they will have that conversation. So don't you know? You can tell them, hey, uh, you know, I'm in the middle of competition. Let's talk afterwards, okay? Um, which actually is one of the other points: is do stay after the squad and talk to coaches, okay? Once you're done with the squad, you know, and you're packing up your stuff. Don't make it your first priority to pack up your stuff and go get food. I mean, I know we're all hungry, we're tired, that sort of thing, but take a little time, talk to the coaches, connect with them, tell them about yourself beyond just what your, you know, what your bowling is like. Talk to them about who you are as a person, what you want to study first and foremost. That's the important part. Okay? Also, bowl to the best of your ability. Uh, when I'm out there uh, looking at uh, potential uh, Purdue players, one of the things that we're faced with is we'll see a, a, call, uh, or a potential player get nervous or, um, or try to do something that they're, that's really not within their game um, or they'll try to be a bowler that they're really not. Okay? We're not. When we're looking for a potential player, we're not expecting everybody to, be, to throw the ball like Belmo or throw the ball like Mike Fagan or anything like that. So play your game. We want to see who you are as a bowler. Okay, not something you're. Not, we don't see, want to see you try to be something you're not. Okay, so be yourself. Okay, uh, the don'ts. I've got some repeats here because they're important. But so don't worry about looking good. Too many kids these days worry about looking good. Okay, that social peer pressure. Okay, the coach is going to respect your game and who you are as an individual much more if you just play your game. If you shoot a 130, but you did it your way, I'm going to look at you a lot more than if you. Uh, we're messing around, and, and even if you shoot 150, 200, something like that, if you're not doing it your way, if you're not being yourself, it's not going to look as good, okay? Uh, don't be afraid to talk to coaches like we talked about, and also don't have a bad attitude. That's the biggest turnoff uh, for a college coach. If they see you have a bad attitude, uh, if they see you cursing, if they, see, if they see you displaying poor sportsmanship, they're probably not going to look at you. Um, that goes a long way to showing what type of character you have and also what type of teammate you're going to be, okay? These are, these are things to pass on to your student athletes, all right? All right, so let's talk about the camps, clinics, and combines. These are other events where you have the opportunity to connect with college coaches. So I've, after you've looked at some different colleges and found one that has the bowling program that you're that they're looking for and as well as the bowling team uh, that you're looking for. Um, look and see if they have a camp or a clinic or that sort of thing. Um, some of the top camps that are out there, Wichita State has a, a phenomenal uh, camp program. Um, they offer two or three different um, uh, full, what I would call full weekend camps and then they also uh, offer some day camps, uh, two day camps, that sort of thing. Um, Purdue has a good, good camp program uh, that we offer every year. Wisconsin Whitewater, uh, Nebraska Lincoln, and these are just a few that I know off the top of my head. There's all kinds of, I would imagine most programs have some type of 
uh, coaching opportunity associated with uh, their program. The opportunity to go meet the coach, get a little bit of one-on-one -on -one time uh, with them and also their players. And the important part of that of this is it gets you an opportunity to see the campus, see what campus life is like, um, and also work with the coach a little bit more one-on-one -on -one so you can see what their coaching style is like. Not everybody is going to match up uh, to everybody's coaching style. Um, when I was looking for colleges, uh, I, I visited several uh, different colleges, and uh, almost all of them had me uh, bowl you know, while I did that campus visit. Uh, one coach that will, re will remain nameless uh, was very much not uh, the style that I would like to work with. I was, at the time, probably 78 to 85 percent sure that I was going to go to that school. And after I made that visit and worked with that coach one-on-one, -on -one, that went to zero. That went to zero fast. So it's important for you to work with, you know, to have your students work with these coaches a little bit one-on-one -on -one ahead of time so that they know their style and they know what they're getting into, okay? Also, combines and showcases, like I talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, the Junior Gold one, uh, every year with Junior Gold, the Saturday, usually the Saturday of registration, there's also a, a, a collegiate showcase where, um, what, 30? 30 to 40, uh, 55, 45 uh, this past year, 45 um, co college coaches or college programs set up tables, set up booths, and basically had all kinds of literature, uh, sign up uh, forms to get more information, all the, you know, just ways to connect with, um, you know, with you, with your student athletes on their program and what they had to offer. And so that, that's an amazing opportunity. If you have a chance to go through that, I'd highly recommend it. Um, also, the ITRC offers a combine every year in August, I believe, um, and that's a great opportunity to go down, uh, work with some, uh, there's always uh, collegiate coaches that attend that as well for recruiting purposes, but also that combine gives you some, um, uh, basically some metrics or some, some statistics about your game that you can then give to uh, these college coaches, um, even the ones that don't attend, um, and basically puts you in a better position or put your student athletes in a better position um, to be recruited. And then the last one uh, Stephen mentioned a little bit too earlier was the uh, TurboTech uh, um, out of uh, Detroit, Turbo uh, Inserts out of Detroit. Um, they put on a TurboTech every year. It started out, it was in Detroit where their facility is. Uh, the last couple years, I think they've moved it to where it's in conjunction with Junior Gold. So I'm assuming this next year it's probably going to be in Cleveland. Um, and it's usually the week before Junior Gold. Uh, so that's a great opportunity also to get not only get coached, uh, get coaching, but also um, connect with uh, collegiate coaches as well. And I've also seen, uh, I didn't put it on here, but I've also seen some regional combine type situations set, uh, starting up. I know, uh, was it Minneap uh, Minnesota, I believe, had, um, had one recently. Um, so and you know so be on look up on, be on the lookout for that too. There might be something like that start up maybe in Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky, you know something like that. So keep that in mind. All right, caveats and questions. Um, there is a difference. You do need to know that there's a difference between NCAA, NAIA. Um, I've, sorry, I see I see there's a mishap there. That's supposed to be NAIA um, and club teams and the way they recruit. Uh, NCAA has the most strict rules when it comes to recruiting. Uh, NAIA has the second most uh, strict rules, and then club teams pretty much have no rules <laughs> for the most part. I mean, there are a few there are a few unwritten rules, um, you know, but for the most part, there are, there's not uh, um, rules there. So make sure that when you're looking at a particular school, um, for example, here in Indiana, if you're looking at a Valparaiso. Uh, versus a Ball State, know the difference between those two programs and know that one is NCAA and one is a club team uh, because that will change uh, not only how you're able to communicate with them but also how that coach is able to recruit you. Okay, the person, the coach at Ball State is going to have a lot less uh, restrictions on how they can communicate with you whereas the coach at Valparaiso is going to have more restrictions. Okay, but oftentimes those NCAA teams have, uh, and, and NAIA teams have more opportunities for scholarships. So there's trade-offs there. All right. Um, yep. Do club teams, does the school actually fund club teams at all, or is it all across the board? The question was, uh, do schools fund the club teams? Uh, that 
runs the gamut. So um, I, most club teams are self-funded. Um, and there are a few, though, that do get funding from the university or, uh, or even from like their student union. Uh, some, of the, some of the bigger club teams uh, get some of their funding from their student union. They have lanes on campus, and they get funding from the student union. Um, or either that or their, their student government, uh, like their student board. But, but most, majority of club teams are self-funded or get minimal you know, club sports funding, you know, a couple thousand dollars a year, that sort of thing. So, yeah. good question. Um, like I said before, be patient but persistent. If, uh, if you email a coach or you reach out to a coach through Facebook and you don't get a response uh, right away, uh, don't give up. Reach out again. If you don't get a response, don't give up. Reach out again. Stay persistent, okay? This is the child's education we're talking about, okay? So first and foremost, the academics, okay? Bowling is just secondary. It's important secondary, but it is secondary, okay? So if the academics are a great fit and they've already gotten into the school, and you're, you're, you're trying to reach out about the bowling program, be persistent, okay? Uh, and that actually kind of leads into the last one is pick a college that's best for, I say you here, at, you know, the student athlete, help them pick a college that's best for them as a student athlete. Academics, first and foremost, okay? All right, what kind of questions do we have regarding connecting with college coaches? Uh, Gary asked a question about the high school state finals. Um, how many college coaches were here to recruit for that? Um, I didn't take a count, so I don't know for sure. I do know one was here because I was here. Um, but other than that, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, I did not see a lot, uh, just uh, by observation. Um, but I also think that it was on the same day as a big collegiate event. So the scheduling conflicts could have could have weighed there. I couldn't answer that, Gary. I don't know. I know the Marion coach makes his rounds, and he's out quite a bit. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. I can't speak to any particular coaches as far as that goes. Um, I think one of the points that I'll make on that is, you can't sit back and wait for them to come to you. You've got to go to them. Okay. Uh, college coaches are, have busy schedules. A lot of them are doing that volunteer, especially at the club level. Uh, so they have, that means they have full-time jobs uh, outside of that. So I think, you, I think being proactive, like I said, being persistent is important here, okay? Scott, do you still coach for Purdue? I do not. This is my first year not coaching. Oh, the question was, uh, she asked if I still coach at Purdue. But no, the, no, I do not this year. Yep. My son's going to Purdue next year, so I'm just wondering if he's coaching. Uh, yeah, they're in good, very good hands. Uh, Bob Davidson coaches the women's uh, program, and uh, Brady Collip coaches the men's program. So, and I've still been asked to help out from time to time. Uh, I'm actually still working with them uh, this evening. So, okay. Any other questions in regard to connecting with college coaches? Okay. Let's move on to Baker Games. Does everybody know what Baker Games are? I'm fairly certain that everybody did, so I didn't give a definition. So that's good. So Baker Games. First off, before we talk about bowling Baker Games in competition, we need to talk about what goes into making a good Baker team. Because it takes a team to bowl good Baker Games. Right? No one individual can carry a Baker game. If you have four opens and then a strike, four opens and a strike, 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 it's still a bad game. Okay? You may have had one bowler bowl amazing, but it, that's still a bad game. So it takes a team. So that we've got to teach our student athletes a paradigm shift in thinking. Okay? We've got to teach them that it's not about what I did, it's about what we are doing what we did okay so what, what we try to teach at Purdue is the mentality of okay if, if I'll use Brady for example if Brady was just up he just finished with me four years um, if he threw a strike then the whole team threw a strike okay that was our frame not just his frame that was our frame 
You really have to drive in this mentality, this, this that it's we together, we have one mission, one common goal, and it's not about, um, you know, if I threw a bunch of strikes in, the, in a Baker game, you know, the most you can have is four. If I threw four strikes in a Baker game and the rest of the team didn't, then we still failed. We still failed, okay? And to succeed, you know, you've got to get everybody working together and understand that it takes the whole team and you're only as strong as your weakest link. I know that's somewhat of a cliche, but it's true, especially in Baker games. So what we do to help uh, get that uh, mental shift going is we do some team building activities, both off the lanes activities as well as the, uh, sometimes we go to off-site uh, places and do some things. So some off lanes activities include um, a game called Knots. How many of you have heard of the game called Knots? Okay, so we get our players together, they make a circle. Uh, usually it's eight, we do them in groups of eight. And they have to form a circle and they reach across and they have to grab the hand of somebody else. Okay, and they can't grab, like, so I can't grab the, the hand of one person and the other hand of that same person. It has to be a different person. And basically when they do that, they create a big knot. And the goal is to get them out of the knot. They have to, without breaking hands, they have to get out of the knot. They have to form a, a big circle, right? So they have to communicate, they have to work together, and it's a great team building activity. Uh, so we do different things like that. There's, there's tons of uh, team building activities um, uh, online that you can find, a lot of resources for that. But I definitely encourage you to get your uh, kids working together, not just on the lanes, but off the lanes as well. Okay, some off-site activities and opportunities. Uh, I don't know if any of you have gone to a ropes course before, uh, but a ropes course is, is a great opportunity to get your team to work together. Um, there's a lot of they, team building activities uh, involved with the ropes course. Uh, Purdue has a ropes course um, there on campus, so we've utilized that uh, from time to time as well. Not as often as I would like, but from time to time. Also an important part uh, for getting them to think as one versus individuals is goal setting. How many of you do goal setting with your team? Okay. I encourage you all to have a goal setting session with your team before the start of the season. We have a goal, uh, goal setting uh, session every year with the Purdue team and we talk about what our goals are uh, not only uh, on a big picture, you know, um, win a national championship obviously is our main goal, but to have a big picture goal like that you've got to have steps to get there. Okay, and so we break it down. We, we set a goal for what we want our spare, uh, spare percentage to be as a team. We set a goal for what we want our strike percentage to be as a team. Uh, we set a goal for how we want to help each other improve. Uh, we set a goal for how many um, you know, top placings we want to have. Uh, we, we set a goal for what we want our Baker average to be. And we set all kinds of goals. So I definitely encourage you to, to, uh, you know, to work with your team and set some of those goals and make it about the process, not just the end goal. You know, uh, saying that I want to have a 205 average is well and good, but what's the process to get there? Okay, make it about the process. Uh, next thing about Bakers is communication is key. Okay, when you're blowing a Baker game, uh, the difference between uh, the guy before you uh, helping the guy behind him strike, him or her, sorry. I'm, I speak a lot in guy terms because I coach a guy's team, um, you know, is, is communication. If they throw a, what they think is a good shot, but the ball went high and they left, uh, say, a four pin, if they don't communicate that to the next bowler, then that bowler may not move and they might leave another four pin. Or even worse, they might split, right? So that communication is key to let that next bowler know, uh, you know, what the lane's given them. Uh, the, and also communicating um, as far as showing support. Baker games is all about momentum. Uh, so sometimes that, you know, or not sometimes, all the time, showing that support and staying positive for your next bowler is important, even if you didn't uh, do what you set out to do in that particular frame. Um, it goes into being present, so being supportive, and being all in. What do I mean by being all in? Okay, trying your hardest, doing the best that you can to make that shot every time, right? Okay, right? And, that, and from that standpoint, it's not only about what you are, being all in on, ev on your team, 
That's the important part. You know, I can be all in on my shot, but if the next frame I'm back eating Cheetos while the next guy's bowling, then I'm not all in, okay? You need to be all in on every shot for your team and for yourself, okay? And then the last thing is practice, practice, practice. How many of you practice Baker games? Good. How many of you practice spares as a Baker team? How many of you do drills in a Baker format? Good, very good. The key is to get them thinking in a Baker mentality all the time. We, we do a drill, um, a spare shooting drill, where we progress through the different pins, but we do it as a, so as a, if it's a five, say we uh, segregate and go into a five uh, person team. So the first person, say we're on 10 pins, first person will shoot their 10 pin. If they make it, the team's one for one. Next person goes. If they make it, they're two for two, and then so forth. The whole team does it. As a team, we have to make nine out of 10 to move on to the next. So if two people, or even one person fails twice, so if we have two failures within that group of 10, then we don't move on. And real quickly, they learn that they've got to work as a team, they've got to support each other, right? So I encourage you to in, in, incorporate bakers into all your drills, not just um, your game drill, not just pulling a baker game, but even the drills as well. Okay, now we're going to talk about some baker game strategies, some lineup strategies and some perspective there. Um, talk about some lane play, some sub, you know, talk about substitutions, and then continuous learning. All right, so what are some strategies for your lineup when you're doing Baker games? How many of you think that the first bowler should be your weakest bowler? Awesome, that's good to see. So the first bowler is actually one of your most important bowlers for several reasons. One is they read the pattern. Right? They tell you what the, what the lane's given you. So you need to have someone very consistent and someone who makes good shots and someone whose ball roll you know, basically gives you a, nice, uh, a, tra a transition that you can read very well. Um, also, the first position is all about momentum. So you need someone who's going to get the team going you know, someone who has a positive attitude um, and somebody who, who really gets you kind of fired up but not in a way that it, it, it causes a lot of, you know, you want to stay on that even keel. Uh, so you've, you've got to have someone that's balanced there in that first, first position. Second position, uh, that's the position where I put, usually put someone who's maybe struggling a little bit, uh, you know, or, or someone that I'm trying to learn um, a little bit about where they can play the lane. That's kind of my, my position to learn about the lane. Um, if I want someone to try a different part of the lane, if we're going through transition throughout the day, then I'll put them in the two hole and that's where we'll try, we'll experiment a little bit more. Okay, the three hole, um, that's my setup guy before the setup guy. So, you know, you've got to have someone pretty consistent there as well. Um, but again, uh, you, you probably put your, your second weakest there um, or someone who you want to experiment with as well. And then obviously your four is going to set up your five, and then your anchor's got to be your, your rock. Got to be your rock, right? But we're bowling as a team, right? So the important part is not to get everybody stuck in a position, okay? I encourage all of you to experiment with your lineup throughout the course of a season, a practice, a game, a tournament. Well, not a game. You can't switch the lineup like that in a game, sorry. A set. One of the things that you don't want to do, and uh, unfortunately I've been guilty at this, of this uh, one time or another, and we try to work through it, is you don't want to get someone to think they're always the one hole or always the, the five hole or something like that. Um, the goal is to get everybody comfortable to play every position. You got to think of it as, uh, you know, if you think of it in baseball terms, you know, everybody needs to be utility guys. You know, your utility men are the men that, or the, the or girls in softball that you know, they'll play any position. They can play your, your second base, they can catch, they can play first base. You want to get everybody to be comfortable in every position. And, and so anytime they're called upon, you know, if, if someone's not usually a five hole, but they're hot, you want to be comfortable as a coach and you want them to be comfortable as a player to get in that five hole so they can give you the most pins. Make sense? Probably common sense, right? 
but still something to think about because sometimes it's easy to get wrapped up in this is the way I've been doing it and, I, and hard to make changes. So, all right. Lane play. Lane play is something at the collegiate level uh, in Bakers we want to do together as a team. If I have, um, you know, if I have a guy playing, uh, if most of the four out of five guys are playing second arrow, you know, with say a ball at 2,000, and I've got one guy playing fourth arrow with a ball at 500, is he helping the team? No, exactly. He's, you know, he's basically uh, deteriorating the shot that we have available. So, um, so you want to make sure that you get, you know, get them playing relatively. Now, I'm not saying all the same. You're not going to you know, build a bunch of robots that are all going to play the exact same board. Uh, but I'm saying similar. You know, using similar balls with similar surfaces in a similar part of the lane. You know, sometimes we had guys with variances. You know, I, I had a guy. You know, uh, say one guy maybe has a higher rev rate. He might be playing 12, and the rest of the guys are playing eight or seven. You know, that's okay. You know, something like that. They're still in the same general area. They're both, you know, they're using a, 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 the same kind of ball. You know, that, I don't get, you don't want to get caught up on board to board like that based on the, the nuances of that individual game. Uh, but you do want to be playing a similar part of the lane together. Uh, substitutions. Um, definitely you want to utilize substitutions when you can, okay? If you, if you have a player that's struggling and you want to get somebody else in there, don't be afraid to do it. Pull the trigger, get them in there, see what they can do, especially during the regular season. Uh, my philosophy has always been to use the regular season to prepare you as much as possible for the postseason, right? So if you've got a player, even if it's a lower skill level, then someone is in there. If there's someone in there struggling and you've got someone on the bench to lower skill level, during the regular seasons, that's the time to make that substitution. Get them in there, give them a shot, see what they can do. Because when it comes time for postseason, if you've got that guy struggling, then you want to be more confident in that decision and you want that player to be more confident in going in there, okay? Also, substituting in the 10th frame and, and also goes in with continuous learning. We want to learn from every shot. So use that fill ball wisely, okay? Especially if, you're, uh, if it's in match play and you're up on the match, you know, every shot matters even if you've already won the game because you can learn from it. You can get another player in there and you can learn from their throw and you can see what they can do or you can have them test a different part of the lane, okay? Or a different ball reaction. So always be learning with every shot. All right. All right. I think that's all I've got. Uh, what kind of questions? Baker's is pretty easy, uh, but there's definitely some things you want to think about with that. Yep. What about if you got uh, four right-handed bowlers and one left-handed? How would you put them in lineup? So the question was if I have four uh, right-handed and one left-handed. Um, again, it just depends on who. Um, the nature of the person individually and how they are at that moment. Um, I don't necessarily, you know, put someone in a position based on if they're right-handed or left-handed. If my left-handed bowler is my strongest bowler and they're on it, then they're going to be five. Um, if my left-handed bowler is my kind of my steady rock uh, and he's going to get the team momentum, momentum, even though he may not give us lane play uh, advantage, I'm still going to put him one because he's going to give us those other intangibles uh, to get us started. Okay. Um, and then basically I would then pretend in my mind like my two bowler is my one bowler for the righties. Does that make sense? Um, if he's pretty steady but he's not quite, uh, you know, the anchor, then I don't have a problem putting him three or four. You know, so it just kind of depends. There's no, there's no, I personally don't make a decision on whether they're right-handed or left-handed. It's more about what they bring to the table at that moment and what we need. Um, you said that uh, all players should be like utility players. Are you talking about maybe moving them around in practice, but when we get to the actual Baker games, try to try to set like uh, who's going to be anchor? Because we play ten games in one day, so yeah. So the question was, uh, I said that it's it's important to get everybody to be like the utility players and be comfortable playing every position. Is that in practice or is that in play? Um, my opinion is definitely practice for sure. You want everybody to get comfortable. And then also my philosophy, and, and each of you will have to consider what your own philosophy is, is especially during the regular season, I put player development and, and, and developing the team above winning. And so, um, so I don't have a problem switching that lineup during a, a regular season competition. Um, because if I get the postseason and I need to do it, to win, 
now that player is going to be a lot more comfortable when I make that move. Does that make sense? For example, a uh, prime example, um, this past season, our, our guy that was probably our anchor the most was Zach Weidman. But when we got the sectionals and bowled 64 Baker games, I had Zach Weidman as anchor, Brady Kolb as anchor, Rolando Sebelin as anchor, and um, one other guy. I'm drawing a blank. Oh, Dustin Zayner. Dustin Zayner as anchor. So I bowled four different guys in the anchor position over the course of that 64 Baker games. I've had a situation before where I put a, my lead bowler, who I was kind of counting on as a steady bowler, to go out there first. And he looks at me and basically the question, am I doing that bad that you're putting me first? So he, he already has this mental block. Mm -hmm. that, that, uh, and I feel like it'll spread to your team. What do you say to the kids to try to make them realize, no, you're not the worst? And then the rest of them, then if you answer them and say, no, I'm not putting you there because you're the worst, then the other kids are going to say, is it me? Then I'm, yeah, then I'm the worst. Nobody, yeah, nobody wants to be the worst, right? Yeah. Well, and that's, that's where we've got to uh, communicate. Uh, before the tournaments, you know, in practice, you know, I would encourage um, doing a session, a, a, a practice, where you don't even go on the lanes. You just get in a classroom or get in a, a meeting room and you talk about Baker games and you talk about the different roles and you talk about being all in as a team. And it doesn't matter who is the worst at this given moment. It matters what we're doing as a team and, and have them hopefully try to come to the realization that, you know, if they strike in the first and they strike in the third or if they strike in the fifth, They've still helped the team to that ultimate goal, right? And so it does take a lot of communication beforehand and even some role playing. You know, you can do some, there's some, a lot of team building where you role play. Um, so don't be afraid to get off the lanes and do, do some activities like that that help build that team mentality. Great question, though. Because you, you do see that uh, at the high school level, you see that more. At the college level, we see um, that, but in a different way. Because most of, the team got, most of the people that make the varsity team at the college level were the anchor at their high school. So now I've got eight anchors. I can't bowl all of them at anchor. So at some point, they've got to set their ego aside and realize that whatever position that they're in, it's important to helping the team succeed. Listen to your players. My, my players last year communicated, and even my anchor, he'd say, hey, I don't have the shot. And he'd switch with the fourth bowler or the first bowler, whoever, whoever had the shot, they'd switch places because they know where they're strong at. They know what their strong points are. Yeah, yeah. so he's, um, for the live stream, he was saying basically listen to your players and, and find out, um, you know, kind of where they want, where they're comfortable and what they want to do at the time. I'm going to flip that on you, though, a little bit because sometimes it's easy to put someone where they're comfortable and then they don't grow. So I challenge you, that especially during the regular season, when you're developing those skills, is to put the players in positions where they're not comfortable. Because they grow more when they're put in those type of positions versus, you know, if, I'm, if I have a player that say, oh, I'm only, only comfortable in the two hole, I'll, you know, I only want to bull in the two hole, first thing I'm doing is I'm putting them in anchor. If it's a, you know, if it's a practice or, or even maybe regular season, like, because I want them to get comfortable the goal as a coach is to develop them and get them comfortable in all aspects. So I'm going to challenge them and help them grow. Now they may fail, they may succeed, but the goal is as a coach is to walk them through that process no matter what it is. Good. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you for the opportunity. I'll be around. So if you have any questions, you know, you can ask me off, off air. Okay. How are you? There you go. Uh, I'm going to leave this one up to you. you got okay, what we're going to do now is uh, load up some information here on reading the lane graphs. Uh, Nick Hoagland, not only is just part of our score 60 team, uh, he is one of the best lane guys I've ever met. Uh, Nick actually wrote the original patterns 
for the PBA's animal patterns back in 19, 2000. or 2002. Okay, what as old as I thought. Uh, Nick's also an accomplished bowler. You know, Nick's a national champion. He has an eagle. Uh, 2001, I believe. Uh, he's responsible for the patterns that you guys bowled on last year for the tournament, for the our state tournament that you're all upset with him about. Okay. <laughs> but I think we only have one problem out of all of them, and that wasn't Nick's fault. That was a lane machine problem. Uh, Nick also is responsible for running the largest college bowling tournament in the country, the Hoosier Classic. It's held out at Western Bowl in February. He's also the president of the Hoosier Charities Board of Directors. He's just recently taken a position at USBC, and I'm not even sure what the title is, but he's the head of all their lane things that they do now, uh, the U.S. Open, the Junior Gold Patterns. Uh, he's the one that's responsible for all those. I'm very fortunate to have been friends with Nick for a long time. He's really helped me out with patterns that we use at our centers, um, the things that we do with the tournaments that we run. He helps me out with our junior program, with a lot of the coaching, uh, and it's because of his knowledge of the lanes. And it's something that's real important to us. Now, what he's going to do here today is run through how to read a graph, uh, how he develops one, how to read it, understand what some of these numbers mean that's going to help you. And then um, when he gets done with this, we've got about a, I've got about a 17 minute, 17 minute video we're going to show you. You guys all got a copy of it. But we want to show it to you just because of the live stream today uh, that talks about practice sessions. Okay, and then after we do that, we're going to move all this equipment out to the lanes. And the things that Nick was talking about with the lane graphs, we're going to have Kristen throwing some bowling balls for us and let you guys see the things that he's telling you here. Because one of the coaches even made a mention to me, it's great being able to read a road map but can we go out here and see it without it, you know, without having those numbers in front of us? Well, we want you to have the numbers in front of you because we want to make sure you're understanding what you're seeing when you go out there. Okay, in that little booklet you have, we have all three of the patterns in there that Nick's going to be going over. They're all three out there on the lanes. Okay, after the video, we're going to take you all out there, let you walk around the lanes, see the videos, we're going to have Kristen throw some balls, and you're going to be able to see and read how those balls move on these patterns. Okay, so it'll be something different for you. Uh, so it's a real pleasure. Nick Hoglin, guys. Okay. We good, Scott? I want to say thanks to Dan Smith. Uh, he's been a friend um, and also uh, a great business partner for years. Also thanks to Steve Kunkel and Scott Devers uh, for having me here today. Um, lane patterns are fun. <laughs> but I say that because I've bowled six games since May. So I don't even get to bowl on the stuff that I design. Um, I do want you to get out the pattern, so if you're in your booklet, please make sure you're on there. We're going to go through those and uh, try to make some sense for you as best as possible about them. How many of you have never really, truly, and be honest, understood what all, that, no, all those numbers mean? Go ahead, raise your hand. I'd like to know. Okay, so about half of you. So I'm going to keep it as basic as we can. For those of you who do have a little bit greater proficiency with it, you want to ask me one of those questions you've never asked, feel free to do so in here or when we're out in the lanes. I'll be glad to answer anything that, um, that you have. So as Dan mentioned, I'm, I wear a few hats in the bowling business. I'm very proud to be associated with 
uh, Indiana High School Bowling. I believe this is our fourth year in developing the conditions that your athletes participate on at the regional, semi-state, and state finals levels. In fact, while uh, Gary and Steve were in here, we just went outside uh, on lanes three and four and did the pattern for this year's regional, taped it, and it's all ready to go. And I'll get into that here in, in just a second. Um, who, who here plays golf? We got some golfers? Okay. Yeah, I know you do. <laughs> I love golf course architecture. To me, looking at a golf course and the holes and where the, the sand traps are and the water hazards, it's just like figuring out where to put the oil on a lane. And my favorite designer of a golf course is a guy named Gil, ha Gil Hance. And Gil Hance designed the Olympic golf course in Rio this year. And he had a comment one day that I thought was really uh, germane to how I feel about oiling lanes. And he said that the only way he was going to design the Olympic golf course in Rio, he lives in Philly, was if he was on site building it himself. And so he got the contract. And he, with his team, built the golf course in Rio. Didn't sit behind a computer, didn't scale it up on a graph, actually went and did it. And I have that exact same philosophy when it comes to oiling lanes. Um, I can sit behind the computer and I can devise all the numbers in the world and my god it looks great on that piece of paper but until you put that on the canvas which is the bowling lane you really don't know how it's going to work and so we take a lot of time to what we call customized patterns so we don't just design them on a piece of paper we actually test them so for me at USBC that means every national championship that USBC has that's open women's uh, junior gold Masters, Queens, Senior Queens, Super Senior. You can rattle them all off, collegiate. Uh, I'll be on site testing the pattern before any competition is going on. I think that's really important. For Junior Gold, who, who here went to Junior Gold this past year? Um, on your graphs, if you notice, there's a, uh, at the top, it says 15 2016 Junior Gold. That's because uh, that's pattern number 15 of 18 that we had to design and test on site for Junior Gold. And I can assure you that there are bowling balls being thrown down those lanes on every single pattern before any of your athletes are going to see it. So we really get into the customization of oil patterns to make sure they're, they're correct, all right? So, yes? At the different centers Junior Gold was on, mm -hmm. uh, because of topography, you have to tweak different shots Great question, Mike. Uh, Mike asked, uh, because of the lane topography, which is a whole separate discussion, do we have to tweak patterns? And the answer is yes. So um, for Junior Gold specifically in Indianapolis, and I live in Indy, so I know the centers pretty well, right? Um, we had a, in my mind, on paper, which by the way, no one saw but me, uh, what we we're going to put out at each center, what we thought was going to be working right. And we hit um, all of them but two. And so for those of you who bowled it, at Junior Gold or watch somebody. Uh, and the boys, 15 and, and U, U15, U20, on the low end at Western Bowl, so Western A, that'd be 1 to 40, that pattern was supposed to be the TV pattern. But when we tested it, we didn't like how it looked. And so we flopped it with what was the actual TV pattern. So the, the TV pattern that you have right in your graph here, number 15, that was supposed to be used during qualifying. But because of topography and how the ball rolled, we decided to flop them. So, um, now coming up for this year in Cleveland, I haven't bowled in any of those centers in 20 years, so I probably won't hit uh, as many home runs. We'll have to make some more tweaks. But the answer to your question is yes, we do change the patterns before anyone bowls on them. So thanks for your question. All right, let's go through uh, some agenda items. This is definitions. All right, this is where we're going to start. Before we get into anything on the graphs, we have to have a basic working knowledge of what the heck this stuff means. In fact, I wrote it down too so I didn't forget. So hold on, let me get to my notes. Oil pattern distance. We define oil pattern distance three different ranges. Short patterns, 32 to 37 feet. Now if you ask Kegel or Brunswick, another lane guy, if you ask uh, Coach Steve, he may give you a different answer than that, um, but in general, 32 to 37 is considered a short pattern, all right? 38 to 42, medium, and then 43 and above, long. 
Um, in international competition, correct me if I'm wrong, the longest pattern that uh, any of our athletes will see is 45 feet. Um, when you're bowling junior gold or you're bowling collegiate national championships, you may see something a little longer. The Hoosier Classic, we ran a pattern 51 feet a couple years ago. Uh, it's not to say that there is a max. Um, in fact, we ran one 55 feet just last year in the finals. Uh, my point is there's no limits to this. Like, we've all bowled for years. We've all said, well, we've always done it this way, so we're going to do it this way moving forward. I throw that notion out the window. Just because something's been done away previously does not mean we have to do it the same moving forward. The bowling balls you're throwing today are completely different than the bowling balls you're throwing 10 years ago. The game's changing. It continues to evolve. So oil patterns have to keep up with that. Okay, anybody know what a reverse drop brush is? Any scholars in the room here besides Coach Steve? Mike? Anybody else? Okay, reverse drop brush on a Kegel Lane machine. The simplest way to explain this is reverse drop brush lets you know where the lanes are single oiled versus double oiled. So back in the late 80s, early 90s, before we had fancy lane machines, uh, the lane machine would used to run down the lane and back, and sometimes the big green light would be on, and that would mean it was oiling. If the big green light was on going both ways, that was double oiling. If it was on going one way, it was single oiling. The reverse drop brush tells you where the double oil begins. So keep that in mind when we start discussing uh, the patterns. Oil per board. So we're talking about a Kegel lane machine, all right? The best way to describe how a Kegel lane machine works, if you remember back in probably the late 90s, we all had inkjet printers. And it had a cartridge, right? And you used to go buy them, and they still cost a million dollars. And you put that cartridge in, and you hit print or copy, and what did it do? It'd go back and forth, back and forth, right? So if you're printing out a picture of your child, it would go back and forth, back and forth. And somehow, mystically, this picture of your child appears on this paper. The lane machine is exactly the same premise, but it has oil in the head. So instead of ink, it has oil. So the programming that you have on the graphs is someone, in this instance me, telling that machine how to print the image on the lane. It goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Instead of giving you a piece of paper with your child's picture on it, it delivers you an oil pattern that the picture is on your graph. Everyone get that? That is the exact same mechanics of how the oil machine works today. Oil per board. Oil per board. The machines are so sophisticated that it uses technology which currently is used for heart transplants in regulating blood flow. That same technology is used in that lane machine. That's why they're so expensive. That's why it's so precise. We can tell it exactly in microliters how much oil we want to put on the lane. And we can adjust that systematically up or down. Very precise. So we'll tell you how that works. Volume of oil. The volume of oil is how much oil is on the lane. This is probably the most important thing for you to look at on a graph besides the length. I'll make sure I get my volumes right. Volume of oil. Light oil patterns. We consider light oil, low oil. 24 milliliters and under. 24 milliliters and under. To give you a comparison, back in the late 80s, when we're all throwing black U dots, Scott Devers is winning PBA tournaments with red hammers, we were using about six milliliters of oil per lane. And now we're using 24 milliliters of oil, and that is light. That is light oil. I know of some bowling centers that are using 30 milliliters of oil for their house shots. That's why, because the bowling balls are so aggressive. They hook so much today. You have to put that much oil in the lane. So 24 and under, light, medium. I, again, this is my definition. I define that as 24 to 28 milliliters of oil. 
and then heavy oil, anything over 28 milliliters. So under 24 is light, 24 to 28 medium, over 28 high. Why do you change that? Why is that important? Well, it depends on how many people are bowling on the lanes, right? If we're going to re-oil after every game, then we don't need that much oil. If we're going to oil the lanes once a day and let people bowl on them all day, then we need some more oil. So it all depends. How many bowlers are on the pair? What type of bowlers are competing? How long are the lanes going to sit? All these are variables into designing an oil pattern. Type of conditioner, this is incredibly important and something that really goes unnoticed. The type of oil you bowl on can drastically affect your ball reaction. And on the graph, at least when it's provided to you, you're going to see what oil they're using. We'll go over those types of oils. The oil used here at this bowling center with this lane surface is completely different than the oil used over at Market Square Lanes. Same lane surface, completely different oil. What that means is the ball reaction is going to be different. So when we oil lanes for the Indiana High School State Bowling Tournament, we change the pattern at every location. Why? Because every location is different. We have to condition the lanes differently to try and get the same result at the end. That's what we're trying to accomplish. You can't just take one shot and put it in every lane machine, every bowling center, it's going to be the same. It doesn't work at all. So when you pull off the cheetah off the web page and put it in your machine, and your ball goes 60 feet on the tour, the ball's hooking off the lane, and you go, what the hell happened? There's reasons for that. A lot of them, all right? It's not just one-stop shopping. It's very customized. Start, stop, loads, mic, speed, buffer. Wow, that's a mouthful. Those are all of the little details on how to program the machine, which we'll go into on the graphs. That's the guts of the program. Forward versus reverse. The thing to take away here is the oil that's applied forward, and we mean by forward is from the foul line to the pin deck. So think about that, right? The machine is going forward to the pin deck. That affects your ball reaction much more than the oil on the reverse. The oil going forward affects your ball reaction more than the oil in reverse. The reason for that is the ball is most sensitive when it's in transition. When it's coming out of heavy oil into medium oil and into that, that, that hard stop friction of the dry back end. So whatever oil you have down the lane towards the dry really can affect how the ball is going to roll. So pay particular attention to the forward oil on a graph. And then the oil ratio. Uh, sport conditions, anyone know what a sport condition ratio is? Shout out, number wise. Three to one. Three to one and under sport. A house shot is probably going to be 10 to one and over. And then anything in between is sort of what we call modified. So for the Indiana High School Bowling Championship last year, I think we bowled on about a four and a half to one ratio. So not sport compliant, right? Not house shot either. All right. So before we get into the graphs, let's talk about two different scenarios. First scenario is junior goal. Second scenario is what you're going to see at the Indiana High School Bowling Championship. Junior gold as of last year, only three people in the world knew the oil patterns before any of your athletes bowled. Three. One was me, one was Gary Brown, who just spoke to you, and one was Gus Falgen, who works for Kegel Company. Three people knew, and I can tell you that because at each lane machine in Indianapolis, and by the way, there were 14 lane machines there, I would go in, put the pattern in, and then choose the security lockout feature, 10 different levels of security with passcodes so that no one can get in. In fact, the Kegel technicians, the professionals who oil the lanes, didn't even know what the patterns were. We just told them, Western 1 to 40, you run pattern 1 today. They run pattern one. That's it. No one knew. I assure you, no one knew. So if you think that uh, Mr. Mann's son got uh, advanced knowledge and knew the patterns, absolutely false. No one knew. Absolutely, positively, no one knew. And that's important because that levels the playing field. 
that allows maybe some of your student athletes who have three or four bowling balls to really fine tune their arsenal instead of someone having 20 who's trying to pare it down. It makes you use your talents more to only have a limit in bowling balls and not know the pattern. You can guess what the pattern length is, but you don't know. This levels the playing field. It re requires more attention to the athlete's development to score. So junior gold, you do not know. Here at the Indiana High School Bowling Championship, we tell you the day of the tournament. We do that intentionally. We think that this is an education and training exercise. We want you to be educated. We want your student athletes to be educated with the patterns. However, we don't want you bringing 17 bowling balls into the center. We want you to make your best guess, come in, we're going to show you a graph, you take your knowledge, apply it to your students and let them bowl. We don't want you to be strategizing two weeks in advance about how to play the lanes. We want them to bowl, to come in and practice, use that effectively. So two different scenarios, junior gold and again a collegiate national championship. I think Scott might alluded to this, you're not going to see the patterns, but the high school bowling championship you are. All right. Any questions on this terminology before we get into a graph? No? Okay, let's go on. Okay, so it's, it's obviously um, not real clear on here, but you have it on your papers. So let's go through this. Okay, so the first pattern title is 2016 Indiana High School Bowling Finals, Lafayette, Indiana. So if your bowler bowled here last year in the state finals, this is the exact pattern and graph that they bowled on. This right here. So let's go through some of the details of the pattern. And I'm going to bring up some of these terms and we're going to go through and, and talk about it. In fact, I'm going to pull this, this other graph might be a little bit more clear. Give me one second. About the same. All right, so top left corner, oil pattern distance. That's pretty self explanatory, right? 41 feet. 41 feet is what kind of a pattern? Short, medium, or long? Medium, medium pattern. What's the next item to the right of it? What's it say? Reverse drop brush. Reverse drop brush. What distance does that say? Reverse drop brush. What is it? I can't read it. So what does that mean? So the brush is rotating the entire time both ways. What that should indicate to you is that there's going to be more oil at the end of the pattern. If it said reverse drop brush 30 feet, you'd know there'd be less oil down the lane because that brush wouldn't be moving. So we have double oil. Just your mind, just keep it simple. There's going to be a little bit more oil down the lane because that brush is moving both directions, forward and back. And that's an important feature. Uh, um, coach could tell you on some of the WTBA patterns internationally, they'll oil 45 feet and that drop brush will be at 30 feet. And that's a completely different ball reaction. <laughs> All right, let's keep going to look off yours, okay? Okay, oil per board. 40 microliters. What that means is that pump we talked about, that medical pump, right, is set precisely at 40 microliters per board when it oils. Not 40 and a half and not 39 and a half. Precise. In fact, we can take a graduated cylinder like we had in elementary school when you used to measure liquids. We can, I have one in my bag. We can take it out to that lane machine, put it in the lane machine, and it will print out exactly how much oil is on the lane. It will prove to you that it's doing 40 microliters per board. Scientifically, it will do it for you. All right? Next line. Forward oil total, reverse oil total, and volume oil total. How much oil is on this pattern total? 23.1. Is that a low, medium, or high volume pattern? Low. Anyone want to guess why? We used a low volume for this tournament. Lane surface is one. Why do you say that? Do you bowl here? No? Uh, I have. The lanes are. Oh, I bowl in woods. Oh, wow. You need some high volume for that. 
Okay, lane surface is one. Lanes here, just by nature, all lanes are different. They have the first ever installation of a Brunswick Pro Anvil lane surface here. First ever in the country, those lanes are. And they're slick. They're just texture wise, they're slicker than other lanes. So that's one reason why. Anybody else? What other reason we that's use a low volume? Low of right. Competition number of bowlers. We don't have professionals with 1,000 rev rates here. We have high school bowlers. Their rev rates are probably going to be less. How many team, people per team? Five. How many games? Three games. Plus some bakers. Two games? Plus bakers. So in mathematics terms, are we even bowling a full traditional league set? No. Are we really close to it or no? We don't need that much oil in the lane. All right? So that's why we don't use a ton of oil. Now, if you bowled at a semi-state location or a regional location, if you bowled on wood, you may get 28 milliliters of oil because of how the lane surface is, the type of oil. In addition to it, you notice at the bottom, it says tank A conditioner, tank B conditioner. What's that say? Control. That's the type of oil they use here. I don't expect you to know that control is very slick. It's a very slick type of oil. So we have very slick lanes, we have very slick oil. We have high school bowlers competing in uh, either the same amount of games as league or slightly less. All those factors mean to me that we're going to have medium or less volume of oil. That's why you have that volume here. If we put out 35 milliliters of oil, that wouldn't do anybody any good. So part of the pattern design is not even about the oil pattern. It's about the tournament, the environment, who's bowling, how long, how many games. That's also very important. Good question. He's asking if the, if the reverse oil and the forward oil being the same factors in the equation. It's two different things. The drop brush is on double oil. But you'll notice if you go down here um, to the second box, if you go to that middle box, there's a, it says one on the left side, and it'll say start, stop, two to two, load zero, speed 30, I'll get into this in a second, buffer, zero it says 41 to 36 see that that means that the oil is clicking on actually physically oiling at 36 feet back the brush is on at 41 but the actual oil is being applied at 36 feet back so um, it does it does affect the design it's all part of the variables so let's actually read this so let's go back up to the top the first box number one 2L to 2R. Everyone see that? 2L to 2R. Does anyone know what that means? Wow, people do know what that means. In programming terms, the machine technically in the old days never could oil the first board back in the late 90s. And since the USBC never took tapes on the first board, it didn't matter right? Because you wouldn't affect your three unit rule. Today it does oil the first board, but it's still referred to as a 2 to 2. So if you think about our example of the head, the ink printer, right? Going back and forth, back and forth. What that's saying is the oil is being applied from 2L, which is the second board on the left side, all the way to the second board on the right side. Five means five times at a speed of 10 inches per second. So let's think about this. 2, 2, 1, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 3, 2, 2, 4, and 2, 2, 5. 2 to 2, 5 times at 10 inches per second. And it's saying to you that the machine is going to oil that. See where it says start 0.0, .0 which is what? The foul line to 5.6. So it's oiling 2 to 2, 5 times from 0 to 5.6 feet on the lane. That's how precise it is. 2 to 2, 0 times, excuse me, 2 to 2, 5 times, 10 speed, 
0 to 5.6. If you look down towards the bottom where the big black dark line is, you can see 2 to 2 five times. So after it's done oiling that, what's it going to do next? This pattern. 6 to 6. Why do we do that? Why wouldn't we oil 2 to 2 again? The heads are going to burn up faster, correct? Also, we're not trying to bowl the US Open here. US Open would be all 2 to 2s, right, for a while. So 6 to 6 is how many times? One time at 14 speed. So now what we're doing is we're moving the oil in. And what it's creating is this shape which is referred to as, and it looks like it, it's a Christmas tree. Most patterns are Christmas trees. So after we do our 6 to 6 one time, we're going to do 10 to 10 five times. Well, that's a lot. At 18 speed. Okay, so let's look at the speeds for a second. 10, 14, and 18, and then it goes to what? 22? So what's the machine doing with the speed? It's going faster. Why? We're shrinking the lane, right? Why would, we want to, why would we want the machine slower in the front than towards the back? We want more in the front of the lane. We don't want our ball hooking early. So most times, I won't say all, most times you're always going to see a lower number earlier. So what, 10, 14, 18, 22, 26. You don't have to know what that means. Just know that 10 is lower than 14. That means it's slower. The speed makes a difference. So we're creating a nice progression of more oil in the front towards less oil in the back. All right? Let's go down to screen four. 14 left to 14 right. We figured out what that was, right? Three times, we know that. 22 speed. Ignore the buffer speed. It's not relevant for this pattern. 20.2 to 29.5 feet. Okay, we got that. Now, the last one. Two to two. What the heck is that? Why would we want to oil flat oil at the end of the pattern? Transition, or is it a trick? How many times are we oiling the two to two? Zero. Zero. Just how the program is. You see zero, it can go two to two, but it ain't going to go anywhere. It says zero. There's no oil there. So what that means is that's our buff. 2 to 2, 0 times, 26 feet, and that's going from 29 and a half to 41 feet. So from 29 and a half to 41 feet, there is no oil being applied to the lane. It's just buffing. So in the old days here, they might have had a 41 foot pattern. They would have said, yeah, we're oiling to 30, buff into 41 feet, to use some old vernacular. That's what this is saying. Whenever you see a 0 loads, that means it's just buffing on the way down. All right? Do you have any questions on that? Let's look at the way back. First screen, two to two, zero. Right? Not oiling. 30 speed from 41 to 36 feet. So that means it's not, again, a not applying oil from 41 feet to 36 feet. And on the way back, it's just like the forward. We have some 16 to 16 three times, 12 to 12 five times, 8 to 8 three, 4 to 4 one, and then we have our 2 to 2, 0, 10. Can anyone tell me why? Look at that last screen. 2 left to 2 right, 0 times. Okay, that makes sense. 10 speed, slow in the front. That makes sense. But we're not oiling from 7.9 feet to the foul line? Why aren't we oiling the heads? We oil them heavy on the way out. Good. Anybody else? More scientific answer? The real answer is that when the oil hits the brush, it doesn't immediately drop on the lane. It takes time for it to get on the lane. So what you're doing is by not oiling technically the front seven feet, you're letting that oil actually bleed out onto the lane. It really is getting oiled, but the programming won't say it. If you program the pattern, if, if this happens in your house, if you ever watch your lane machine in your bowling center, 
and that little head timer is moving back and forth when it hits the foul line, you got a problem. Because guess what? Every lane from then is going to get more oil because it's stuck on the brush. So you will never see, you should never ever see the oil head moving when the machine is at the foul line on the way back. It should always stop ahead of time. That ensures the same level of oil is being put on every lane. That's really important. Down at the bottom, look at the ratios, 4.19. We mentioned that that is a what type of pattern? Modified pattern. If it was sport, it would be three and under, probably house shot 10 and over. So it's a 4.1. All right, let's move to the other patterns and then we can um, do some online stuff. Next pattern is which one? Let's see. USA Bowling, great. So we had a 4.1 pattern. Now what's this one? 16? Did you guys watch those U12 boys and girls on the TV show? They were whacking them. Why? Well, they were a little soft. They were a little soft. We want some, they're a little soft. That's okay though. They weren't bowling junior gold. They're bowling USA Bowling, different tournament. So 16 to 1 is a house shot. And that's okay. All different levels of skills. So this pattern was 42 feet, right? We had a drop brush, 40. Why is the volume 26.3? That seems awfully high for 12 year olds. Correct, everything's in the middle. How do you think you get them to be easy? You have to add some volume to the middle, right? How many two to twos are on this pattern? Two. That means three units of oil at the end of the pattern. So they're legal, they're USBC certified. They're fine. They're just not sport. 16, 16 to one. Even I can strike on this one. <laughs> Let's just really quick look at the programming. So we have two to two, two, right? 9 and I, and then look at this. We got 10 to 10, 2, 11 to 11, 3, 12 to 12, 3, 13 to 13, 4. We got all this oil in the middle of the lane. And this is going to be very similar to your house conditions wherever you bowl. You're going to see this if you look at the graph. All right? So that's pretty easy. Let's go to the last one. Okay, this one's a little more complicated. Dan, how much time do I have? Okay. So this is the junior gold television pattern that uh, Mr. Mann won his national championship on, actually. This is what the U-20 boys and the U-15 boys bowled on in match play and TV. Exactly the same. Again, no one besides me, Gary Brown, and Gus Falgen knew this pattern at any time at all until after the tournament. Now this one's a little more complicated. First of all, I'll tell you the design of this pattern is very similar to last year's US Open. Part of the junior gold um, philosophy, at least this past year, was um, exposing our student athletes to more than just WTBA patterns. So they got to bowl on a Kegel Winding Road version. They bowled on WTBA. They bowled on US Open. They bowled on Collegiate National Championship. They were bowling on all sorts of different types of patterns. So this one happened to be um, a, a variation of the US Open. All right, let's take a look. How, how long is this one? 43 feet, so that'd be Short, medium, or long? Long. Okay. Reverse drop brush? 39 feet. So a little bit shorter than the other patterns we saw, right? All right. Oil per board, multi UL. What the heck is that? A lot. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> that is the fancy way of saying that we can control how much oil and, and fluctuate that each time we have a new screen. And I'll show you how we do that. All right, pretty neat. All right, how much total oil do we have? 26.1, which is what? Medium. Um, done a lot of TV shows on the tour and with this. Think about lights, hot lights. Ever been in a TV set for bowling? Very hot. Think about the lanes and the oil. Oil is liquid, right? What happens when liquids heat up? It, it, it can evaporate, it can spread out. The viscosity does what? It gets thinner, 
lower. And then how we're bowling TV with this, we're bowling five TV shows in one day. So the turnaround's quick. I mean, those lanes are not sitting there half an hour. They're getting oiled and they're getting bowled on. You're going to see a lot of carry down. If you start putting 30 milliliters oil out, you're going to have oil everywhere. So the, the television show is another variable to pattern design when it comes to this. Literally. Can't have too much oil. Um, the, and I can, I, I'm, I'm assuming he'll tell you that the lanes probably played very different in the TV arena than it did during bowling match play for some of the athletes. Nothing you can do about it. Okay, here we go. Pattern. Oh, for, oh what oil are we using? What oil is that? Fire. Okay, so Kegel Fire's medium, kind of a middle of the road pattern, uh, oil. We didn't use ice. Anyone heard of Kegel Ice Oil before? Way too slick. Way too slick for us today. Maybe next year. We'll see. Two to two, four times at how many microliters? 35, 18 speed. Okay, great. Next one. What we got? Six to six, three times at 40. Okay. So what happened to the microliters from the first screen? It went up. That's multi-UL on the top. We can change how much oil is being put on the lane per screen with the new lane machines. We can fluctuate it. And the reason why we do that is to make sure we fine-tuned the oil pattern. The original design of this pattern was two to two, four times at 45 microliters. That was the original design. The ball just didn't hook off the corner enough. It just didn't hook, so we had to lower it. That's what that machine allows you to do, is to fine tune the oil. But again, you can't do that unless you're actually on site bowling, right? You can't figure that out in an office. You actually have to go do it, go bowl on it. What else we got? Seven to seven, two at 45, right? Eight to eight, one at 50. 99, one at 50. 10 to 10, two at 50. Okay, that all seems normal. All right, next, two to two, zero, 22 speed, and then we have a two to two, zero at 10 speed. That doesn't make any sense. Why do we have that? What, what is the purpose of that? Machine's slowing down at the end of the pattern? Why would we do that? Hey. Allows the oil to spread out more, correct? Another reason, it allows hold to develop. So think about this, when the machine goes slower, does it put out more oil or less oil? It puts out more, right, because it's going slower. What doing a little bit of a design of putting a 10 at the end of the pattern does, is it slows the machine down and allows that oil to have a little more concentration in the center of the lane. We want that to occur at least this past year for television. Give them a little bit more hold. People are nervous, it's a national championship, bright lights, friends, family, a couple hundred thousand dollars in scholarships. It's a lot of pressure. We want to make sure that our athletes had a chance to, to bowl well and we think it worked out. So you're going to see that sometimes on patterns where there'll be a, a decrease in speed at the end. Not all the time, but once in a while you'll see it. Okay, on the way back we have 2 to 2, 0, 15 to 15, 5 to 5, 2 to 2. And what was the ratio at the bottom? 2.5. So still sport compliant, right? Right. Still sport compliant. All patterns of junior gold have to be sport compliant. Two and a half to one. Okay. I think that's it. A lot of info. Anybody have any questions before we go on the lanes? Okay, thanks. Thank you.